Blah. Hey, what's going on? I wish that I could say that I was making this intro under more positive circumstances, but that doesn't happen to be the case. We got some sad news today that confirmed without a doubt that Manny Martinez, the first drummer of the Misfits, a founding member of the Misfits, the drummer on She and Cough Cool, part of the trio, the original trio of the band with Glenn Danzig on piano and Jerry only on bass, has left the building today. In the near future, my intentions are to do a proper episode dedicated to Manny and his incredible drumming, and I'm hoping to have maybe a few guests on for that show with people that actually either met him or knew him, but uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. In the meantime, what you're about to see is actually the very beginning of everything. I began doing this, whatever this is, me talking on the channel, the show, the thing, whatever, talking about hearing Manny's incredible live tape. There's a lot of really great information in these early episodes, but they are dense and long, and I do not have the time to sit and pull out all of the relevant information. If you've never listened to them before, you might find them interesting, especially if you like this show, if you like this channel and you watch this stuff, or maybe you haven't heard it in four years. That's right. In March, we are coming up on four years of broadcasting. Can you believe it? Can you believe this has been going on for four years? Hours and hours and hours, hundreds of hours of talking. But it all began with these first four episodes, and they detail the adventure of going out, meeting Manny, interviewing him, and listening to his tape. I just want to clarify, though, Since these broadcasts, new information, new revelations have come to light, and there are certain details, aspects, whatever, things that are outdated or need to be up, would need to be updated. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not here to correct them. I'm presenting these things as they are. Just understand the main one, the most egregious one is the fact that I now know definitively, definitively, definitively that the song that I thought was Harpies in the Night is not Harpies in the Night and is instead a song called Drive Me. I don't know. My brain so desperately wanted to hear Harpies in the Night that I could have sworn he was saying, singing Harpies in the Night. Who friggin' knows, man? Point being, it was a song called Drive Me. Harpies in the Night is a completely separate song. That's probably the most glaring error in, I think, these early episodes. There's probably more. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on, Jeff. I've gone to the trouble and decided to interject here and fully clarify this statement. So in addition to knowing that Harpies in the Night is actually a song called Drive Me, The tape baking. Okay, so when tapes are baked, when they bake the tapes to run them through the machine one more time, I kind of had, or at least how I remembered the story, was that the tapes were disintegrating. Disintegrating is the wrong word. It's so inaccurate. It just, it just, you can't, it just won't play. Nothing, nothing comes up. That's what happens. The tape runs through. How, how could it disintegrate? If it disintegrated, then what would be the tension that pulls the tape through the playhead, right? So the tape does not dis- literally disintegrate, but once it runs through and is digitized, there's nothing else. You can't, it's unplayable. It's done. It's it's cooked. There's nothing else there. That's the clarification. So there's no disintegrating of the tapes. Glenn sitting down and doing his vocals for Static Age, that was something that I had heard at some point from somebody And I, for the life of me, cannot find anywhere else where this is clarified or corroborated. So I don't know if Glenn was sitting down. In fact, I don't think he was sitting down. In fact, I'm pretty sure that when I spoke to either Frank or Jim one day, they told me the opposite. So as far as I know, to correct myself, I briefly said that Glenn sat down when he did the vocals. I don't know where that came from. Like I said, I heard it somewhere. Just want to clarify, not don't know. Don't actually know. I mentioned that I was looking for Freddie Linzer, this guy, Freddie Linzer, and I never did find Freddie Linzer. He was right under my nose the whole time. I guess he had a Facebook profile and everything. And I just never connected with him. 
He unfortunately passed away not too long ago, maybe a few years back. Interesting note though, Chris, Headhunter Chris from Morning Noise sent me a photo, either a photo or maybe it was a a YouTube link or something that Freddie, the guy, Freddie, Freddie Shoes, the guy who's thanked on the back of, of, on the back of Cough Cool, uh, recorded his own single. He recorded his own music and uh, it was cool to finally see a picture of what Freddie Linzer looked like. Freddie Linzer essentially was, you know, Quote, unquote, he was like, you know, a manager of the misfits, but you know, to, to what extent to the same extent that, that Dave street probably was not, not very significant. I don't know. I don't want to downplay, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it was, but point being is I don't think it was anything really serious in terms of him managing the band, but I don't know. Somebody correct me. Last caress. It is my understanding that last caress was not actually written on the guitar and that it was written on the piano. That is my understanding. Okay, and one last thing, the master tapes for Cough, Cool, and She, I mentioned this in this, whatever you're about to watch. Yes, these things went missing. That tape went missing. What they used on the box set is Erie Vaughn's mint copy of Cough, Cool, She. They made a dat from the the actual vinyl itself, and that's how it's on the box set because for that reason. Um, Is it? destroyed is it lost is it missing who knows i do have one theory that i can't really express on here as to where i think that master tape is where it went to but totally hearsay and something i'm not going to elaborate here on the channel but i have an idea of what what where it could have gone but i do not definitively know however is the third song from those set they did three songs we believe that the third song is Harpies in the Night. Are these songs, is the master tape lost? Is the third song, the studio version, lost? Possibly not. And the way that it could still exist, the way that it could still be there, if the master tape is gone or the master tape can never be found or whatever, and it's just whatever, the way that it could be found is if there's a runoff tape. A runoff tape is at when you're done mixing for the day or recording for the day, the engineer makes you a cassette tape that you can take home so you can listen and play back. One of these runoff tapes is how uh, we have static age mixes because Frank Bronche Coma, he took his and he put it in a safety deposit box. We had it. He, he held on to his, he held on to one of them. So the purpose be purpose. Bleh, what I mean to say here is that it's very possible that somewhere within the possessions of Glenn Danzig or Jerry only, or Manny, that there could have also been somewhere lost, unlabeled, who knows, misplaced, sitting at the bottom of some box in storage somewhere, a runoff tape of the the studio studio mixes, rough mixes of She, Cough Cool, and the third elusive song potentially being Harpies in the Night. If If anybody has this runoff tape, it would be Glenn or Jerry. And, you know, in the same way that, you know, Erie Vaughn has a large collection of stuff, he has tapes and audio of his time in Danzig and whatnot. As he mentioned, John Christ, too, you know, has tapes, runoff tapes, whatever things, you know, bells and whistles and things, you know, from from being in the studio and then getting a tape. You know, you take it, you listen to it in the cassette player, and then you throw it on the, you know, you throw it. Whatever, you throw it on the counter. We got to go back into the studio tomorrow. We're going to get a brand new mixtape. You got to imagine these things accumulate. Where do they go? Are they thrown away? Are they erased? Are they repurposed? It's somewhere within Jerry Only's collection of things, archive of things. Does he have a runoff tape? Glenn, does Glenn somewhere sitting at the bottom of a box in the back of a closet, does he have a runoff tape? Uh, Who knows? Who freaking knows? but it does capture the imagination. Okay. Without further ado, Jeff, resume what you were talking about, but I just thought it was, I I thought it would be important to update, to give this update. If you know, I'm going to rebroadcast these episodes. Listen, I want to do a proper tribute to Manny. So it's not going to be here, but I'm so sad to hear of his passing and I'm so glad that I got to interview him and that his essence and some of his insights are documented on tape. That's super duper important for the future. 
to start us off before we go into the episodes, I'm going to show you a Facebook live stream that I did in 2017 when I hung out with Manny and we listened to the Cough Cool record, She and Cough Cool together. I don't know why this was like before I got into doing live streaming. It's not very long and I'm also going to make it even shorter because I'm going to cut out the part where we're listening to the song. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, it's like, I, I just, I, back then I just didn't, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I never know what to say, but at least now I can talk. I guess maybe I was, it was more shy. I just, I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't sustain the live stream is what I'm trying to tell you. I could not sustain the live stream and it shows. But this is like proto, proto, they came from Lodi, hanging out with Manny, doing a live stream on Facebook before I could even fathom what I was doing. And then you'll see the first broadcast, the second broadcast, the third broadcast. And, uh, you know, spin, spin cough cool, spin cough cool and she in honor of Manny when you have a chance. Thank you to Manny for helping to shape one of my favorite bands, one of our favorite bands that we love and cherish and revere, The Misfits. Without further ado, Jeff, run the rerun. Run the rerun. Run the rerun. Run the rerun. Ooh. Hello, hello, Facebook land. Uh, today, uh, I'm going live. Uh, we have a uh, very special uh, guest uh, with us. Uh, there's Jack right there. Say hi, Jack. Hi. Uh, there's myself, and uh, I am in an undisclosed secret location with uh, a, a very interesting fellow. Uh, you may remember him from uh, a seminal punk band called The Misfits. Here is Manny Martinez. Manny, say hello. Hello. To Facebook. Hi. Hello, hello. How you doing? Um, Manny did an interview uh, with us today. It was a really great interview he gave. Um, and we were talking about uh, old times. And we decided it would be really fun to give you guys a uh, special treat and uh, uh, play uh, the record that Manny played on. Uh, re what record was that again, Manny? Cough, cool, and cheap. Yeah, so we're gonna play that for you now. I actually brought a turntable. Long story. I won't. I won't get into details. <laughs> but uh, we brought a uh, brought a turntable, and um, we're gonna play for you right now um, this uh, record. Is there anything you'd like to say about uh, uh, cough, cool, uh, Manny? Anything or? It was fun. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of fun. A lot of fun. So uh, let's uh, let's get that started, and uh, here, come over here. Right, Take out. <laughs> this is my stereo right now. <laughs> I um uh, I had to bring this all the way from my home. It's a long story, but uh, it had to uh, had to happen. So right here, this is uh, the record uh, which Manny signed for me. And um, yeah, we're, we're in, this is Manny's conference room um, where he conducts all of his business and whatnot. You know, we, uh, so here we go. We have the record right here. It's not a real one. It'll be too expensive. That's our secret. Shh. So let's play this right now live. I don't know which side it is either. Manny, would you care to take a guess which, uh, which side? Uh, yeah, no, they didn't even bother to write it, right? Uh, it'll be the first song. You think it'll be the first song? Yeah, that's Cough the way cool. It was. <laughs> All right, that's cool. That's cool. All right, so now let us what? Let us uh, play it for you right here. You're gonna. Oh, you know what? I taped the stylus down. Oh my god. Because uh, we were driving in the car and I was afraid. Professionals. That... <laughs> Professionals. Exactly. Exactly. But I was, we were afraid that it would not a, uh, uh, that it would jump around. We gotta switch it to 45, and here we go. We're going to play this for you right now. Oh no, it's being stubborn. Sometimes you gotta treat record players like they are um, babies? babies, like they're women, like they're uh, uh, a sensual woman. Ah, that's not, that's not how. That's not how. All right, let's try this again. There we go. And Manny was right. 
Listen to that jazzy style that Manny's playing right now. This record was recorded in 1977. Right? Yep. When in 77? April? March? May? He doesn't remember the exact date, folks. It was a long time ago. Who could blame him? Right? Am I right? Yeah, I'm gonna... Oh, no. It's inviting friends. This is... Yeah. Listen to that jazzy... That jazzy touch that Manny adds to the drums. Manny, what do you think cough cool means? What is cough cool? What is it to cough and cool? I guess to cough cool. Yeah, because you don't want to cough like a dork. You don't want to, you don't want to cough like a butthead. Yeah. <laughs> that would be bad. We don't want we don't want to cough like buttheads. Listen to those. I don't know what that is, but that trips. Trips. Those are trip trip triplets? Trip. Triplets, okay, I don't know anything about playing drums. But it's almost the end of the song. Yeah, in the percussion world, industry term, industry standard, there are they are known as crips. Trips. Trips. Trips, sorry, I had butchered. Yeah. The way I trip over my words when I'm trying to uh, talk. Yeah, you know, no, not L S D or anything. Right? Trip. Yeah, hell no. Yeah, we had a we had a fun day here today. We we learned a lot from Manny. He uh, he was a real sport in uh, having us, and we're very grateful uh, uh, to be guests of his. Okay, and now we're gonna flip it over. So by process of elimination, we gotta wait. We gotta wait, people. We got to wait. Okay, now. We're flipping this over to side two. And we're going to listen to She. She is about uh, Patty Hearst and Stockholm Syndrome and what crime can do to the mind. What, what did that mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, nothing. No reason. That was uh, listening. Listening with Manny, another episode of listening, listening to records with Manny, and um, so we bid you a, a farewell. Uh, everybody, say hi and goodbye to Manny. Sayonara. Sayonara, Jack. Hello. Good to see everybody. Um, goodbye. Martinez, the original drummer, who I had tried to, I had no, I had heard whereabouts of him. I had heard that he had a tape. Here's where it gets interesting, folks. I had heard that he had a tape. I heard that there was a tape of of material, uh, of, and apparently it was way more than just a tape. But at the time, there was a tape uh, that was practically unlistenable, uh, that was in Manny's possession. Um, Manny had brought it to a member of the band who I'm not going to name because this is secondhand information who listened to it and thought it was kind of unlistenable. Uh, and so he just sort of was like, he just sort of had this, this, this tape that everybody in the year 2017, it just broke in our little misfits community that there was this, this new discovery, this new relic, uh, uh, and, and nobody, nobody knows how crazy this tape is. It is a crazy fucking tape. Uh, and so, um, it was right around that time that Manny just suddenly is on YouTube and he's doing this, he's doing interviews from his residence where he stays. And I was just like blown away. I'm like, this guy, like, this is a guy who I've like, I've seen, you know, you've seen two pictures of Manny. You just don't know anything about him. You know, and if you're a misfits nerd, like I am, it's like, this is like a, a, a big piece to the puzzle from a historical standpoint. There's a lot of history. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of historical significance. So to hear that Manny, suddenly, to, to bring it all back around, to hear that Manny is suddenly found an internet presence and he makes a Facebook uh, blew my fucking mind. And so I reached out to him and we uh, started talking. And um, 
eventually I convinced him to let me. And it's funny, we had our first conversation on the phone the very night that I saw the Misfits play live in Chicago. The true Misfits play for the first time in my life. I'm about to see this band, and the first drummer calls me on my phone, returns my phone call, and I'm like, whoa, Manny Martinez, this is crazy. And so I'm talking to Manny, and we're, we're working out plans. Uh, this was fall of 2016. We're working out plans to meet up, and that meeting did not happen until February 23rd, 2017, when a friend and I uh, drove out to meet Manny, um, where he lives, and uh, hang out with him, and we hung out over pizza and talked and talked, and I interviewed him for, you know, I'm saying now it's an hour, I think it's a little bit more than an hour, is how long I interviewed him, um, and you know, I made a huge mistake, I interviewed him first, and I really wish I had interviewed him second, and you know, sometimes you just do things with, not without, thi yeah, kind of without thinking, or or in a rush because you know you think your opportunity is going to dry up in two seconds. You don't. You can't think about how to properly put it together. And it's only in hindsight that I realized that I wish I had interviewed Manny second after what he he showed me because over the phone and online a little bit he started to talk about that tape again. And it was right around that time that not only was there one tape, there was apparently another tape. And I guess uh, that other tape. Uh, had a song, or there was made reference to a song that we've only heard in, in you know, like in passing, um, called the Marble Index, and the lyric, something about uh, spraying index, wiping your mind with index for the marble in, spraying your mind with Windex to what, wiping your mind with Windex for the marble index, something like that. I don't know. This blew my mind. And I don't know if that's a Misfits song or if that's a proto-Misfits song from one of Glenn's pre-Misfits projects, like Pony, which you've heard of now, Prostitutes of New York. But see, nine years ago, I was talking to Rick Riley from The Victims, and he was like, I didn't know, oh, he mentioned Pony, and then he talked about the scuba, scuba suits. They performed in scuba suits and stuff. And so maybe Marble Index is actually from that band. I don't know. Uh, again... Everything I'm about to say now, everything I'm about to talk about, everything that I've been talking about is just from either my experience or from what people have told me. Again, I am no fucking expert on this shit. I'm not. I'm not. I'm just a fucking enthusiastic fan slash filmmaker who's trying to turn all these things that I've learned about into something more, into like, you know, uh, a story. And so... So we go to meet Manny, we sit, we do this interview, I do an interview, uh, it gives me some great stuff on tape, he tells me about how the band formed from his perspective, he tells me why he left the band, um, he tells me about CBGBs, and he just tells me about a, a few, just a bunch of stuff, um, he tells me about kind of how they put songs together, as I recall, again, I haven't listened to this interview in two years, so after I interviewed Manny, he played for me a tape that blew my fucking hair back, that blew my mind. Going back to the reason why I brought up all that Misfit Central talk. Remember I was talking about Misfit Central and how Mark Kennedy sat down with Glenn Danzig and, and Glenn told him a bunch of shit like this this one time. You know, that's how we also learned about some, some other things. Uh, we learned uh, about some songs that... Um, that that there's no recording of that that just don't exist like except for the song titles uh mark had um had heard from glenn that there were these three early songs um the first one's called west end avenue the second one is called harpies in the night and the third one is called feline nursery now feline nursery um we have kind of heard because feline nursery is actually uh, something called uh, 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 fucking <laughs> Spinal Remains. So if you've listened to Spinal Remains on, on the Static Age, you are hearing Feline Nursery. The song was originally called Feline Nursery. And in um, Mark Kennedy's, um, Mark Kennedy does make mention in his, in his notes. And again, this could have come from Jerry and not from Glenn, but I believe it came from Glenn, um, that, that he knew that the original... The original uh, uh, lyric, the, the song starts, as I would later find out for myself, 
the song starts with, I'm going to throw away the key to the feline nursery. And then it kind of goes into Spinal Remains. The lyrics are slightly different, though. Um, and so, for years, right? Like, 20 fucking years, maybe. Maybe 20 years. Again, not, don't quote me on this. Again, not a fucking expert, just a dude who fucking loves this shit. So for 20 years, us Misfits nerds on Misfit Central fucking sat and talked and, you know, waxed. And, you know, I don't think I, I wasn't there for 20 years, but I was there for a long ass time. I'm not going to tell you what my handle was. Some of you might know. Um, uh, waxed poetically about, like, what the fuck is Harpies in the Night? What the fuck is uh, West End Avenue? What are these songs, man? Like, what are these songs? Like, you know, we'll never know. You know, the closest thing that we knew was um, what we had heard uh, on the original Cough Cool She 7-inch. Okay, again, warning, about to get really fucking nerdy right now. Um, that's the only snapshot. It's amazing that so early in that band's existence that they had the fucking insight, foresight, to record a 7-inch. Like, they hadn't even been together for a year. And they took, and that just shows... I mean, really does, it's a testament to Glenn and his material and his tenacity and, you know, uh, them going, all right, we're going to record. Because you know what? That's like what kept them going. You know, they died. And as I, this I remember from my interviews. They fucking died. That band died. But those fucking seven inches lived on. And those seven inches turned into tape cassettes in the late 80s that got traded around. You get a 10th generation tape and it's got like the gnarly fucking hiss on it. It's like, yo, listen to this shit, man. It's like, hey man, what's that skull on your shirt? Oh, let me give you this tape to borrow or to dub. And you hear it be like, holy shit, this is the fucking Misfits. All of that shit, you know, that shit endured because they recorded so much. So here's this this single, this, this, this um, uh, what's it called? Like a, a timestamp, a, a bubble of what that band was at that time. Uh, and that's the closest, because it, it, there are only three instruments on the first single. Glenn originally played piano. Uh, Jerry was on bass and Manny was on drums. There was no guitar. And so nearest as I could tell or anybody could tell, those early songs like Harpies in the Night and West End Avenue probably sounded something that was very close or a lot like fucking, you know, uh, what we heard on Cough Cool and She. And as I will later note in my notes that I'm going to read for you. So, another thing. I don't... I, I'm... What I'm about to uh, re report on, or I don't know what, like, talk about, um, is, is something from from three years ago. You know, I, I I got to listen to this tape. Manny played the tape for me, the, the of the live show. And I'll get into that, what that is in a minute. Manny played the fucking live show for me. Uh, and the first thing that I did, and I even did it while we were listening, I had a little piece of paper with me, I'm just jotting down as many fucking th thoughts in my mind as I'm trying to take in this fucking historic shit. I'm like trying to like, just sort of like jot down anything I can remember, anything like, so I could keep that memory. And I will tell you, you know, that sometimes when you know something is important enough, you your brain, it's like your brain etches etches it, that information, deep into the grooves of your fucking mind. You know, you get those fucking wrinkles in your mind, you know, like, whatever it is, those fucking wrinkles, it etches it deep, and I still, you know, I, I hum those, that what I remember, as much as I can remember, uh, 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 over and over and over, because I never want to forget what I heard in that, <laughs> in that fucking, you know, uh, 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 session with, with Manny. Uh, and so I'm sitting there scribbling, uh, just, just writing, fucking feverishly uh, writing. After after I left Manny, I'm sitting there and I'm going through the whole set list and I'm just writing every fucking thing I can remember. And I'm so glad because, you know, in the process of writing it down, just in the way I asked those questions in all those interviews, I don't remember all the stories because they, they live on the tape. I don't have to remember them all. And it's the same thing here. So what I did was I looked at my notes that I have not looked at in almost three years and I tried my fucking best to expand on them and like sort of meditate on them and remember everything. So sometimes when you hear something so fucking important, you etch it into your fucking mind and you, you jot down notes. And so what, what Manny played for me was a fucking revelation. It was this, just this, this thing that like, I, I, I didn't, I couldn't believe that it exists. You know, when they say like, you know, it's like, Oh, 
Well, you know a million dollars. Uh, how do you know a million dollars really exists? You've never seen it. It's like, but you know it exists. It's like you know this exists, but like you can't possibly fathom. Because if you saw a million dollars in real life, you'd be like, holy fuck, that is a lot of money. Even though a million dollars is a footnote to a billion dollars, you still be like, holy fuck, this is so much money. And it's the same sort of thing. It's like it's like you know it exists. You've heard that it exists, but you don't know if there's any record of it. And to see that it actually exists. It's just like, it's more than anything you could ever possibly imagine. Um, especially if it's something that you've been thinking about and anticipating and has captured your imagination for years and years and years. Something you thought you would never get just in the way that we never thought we were going to get a fucking Misfits reunion, right? Um, so, uh, here's the, here, I'm going to start reading from this thing, uh, this thing that I sort of uh, uh, brushed up on and, and, and wrote, and, and I'll talk about it, I'll pause from time to time, to sort of talk about what I'm writing or what I wrote, uh, uh, and and provide a commentary, kind of like uh, you know the Torah. There's the Talmud. You know the the Torah is the Torah is the Bible, and then the Talmud is like a commentary on the Bible, that sort of thing. Okay, so February twenty third, twenty seventeen. Introduction. Uh, by the way, some of the time is really weird. I should really collect uh, correct that the the timing. I say yesterday, and then I say today, and it's just because I had you know, written this out uh, over a few different days and sort of just talked about, like, presently where I was. Um, Yesterday I met with Manny Martinez, the first drummer of the Misfits. After conducting an hour-long interview, it was not an hour long, it was longer than an hour, he played me a recording that he had made of the band at what I believe is their third show, third live show, at Eddie's Rock Palace in Teaneck, New Jersey, on October 9th, 1977. How do I know that? I know that because of Mark Kennedy and Misfit Central. Um, I don't know 1,000 million percent, but when I add everything up, based on what's on the recording, based on what Manny was saying, and based on uh, what is on Misfit Central, I am pretty sure that the that tape I was talking about, what I listened to, the recording, is the third live Misfit show ever. That is the third time as a band, and not only that, it's a turning point for the band, which I'm going to read about now. It is a pivotal, 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 I can't fucking talk. It is a monumental moment in that band's time uh, where they would turn, where they would uh, sort of uh, become this different thing. Ready? So, um, as mentioned, between songs, the band had already recorded and later released their first seven-inch single, Cough Cool She, earlier that year in June. I forget which song it is. Uh, I'm sure it's in the other notes that I have not looked at. I only looked at the notes for this particular song, as well as the intro. Um, uh, I have to go back and, and look and see what song that was. But uh, at the end of one of the songs, uh, I, I know it sounds weird because Glenn was, what, like 23 at the time? But I guess still, it was like a baby-voiced Glenn. Like, Glenn just doesn't sound like, you know, you know how Glenn's voice is very raspy today, and, and even in... You know, the early 90s, he just had a deeper register, and even in the Misfits, he had a deep... Like, it just sounds, like, very different. I don't know what it, what it is. It sounds like a guy who's just starting out. He says on the tape, he goes, he goes, yeah. Oh, you know what it was? Oh, fuck, obviously. It was on either Cough, Cool, or She, because they played both of those songs live. Uh, and he goes, that's on our latest single, uh, Cough, Cool, She. You can pick it up, blah, 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 blah. So they'd already recorded that song, right? Which means that this show had to be after June of 77, assuming that that is, in fact, the studio session. And, you know, from Misfit Central, I believe it to be true. I know that there, on Facebook, there is a lot of, like, there are a lot of Facebook groups, really cool ones, by the way. You should check them out, seek them out. Facebook themed collector groups where people are sort of not, they're building upon and and sort of updating and correcting a lot of the misinformation on Misfit Central because there's a ton. It's not you know there's a lot of misinformation mostly around record pressing stuff, uh, which also comes from uh, uh, Mark Kennedy as well as uh, Glenn in the Pusshead interview from 1986, the most epic, probably in depth, detailed interview Glenn Danzig has ever given in his life. Uh, maybe someday he'll give something more in depth, but I don't think it's ever going, nothing's ever going to stand out like that three hour session. And it's amazing that that tape leaked and it's great. You know, I'm sure that that was a great source from Mark Kennedy as well when coming up with his timeline. 
Uh, so yeah, so so if that was in June, that means that this that 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 and they had already had it out and they had it at the show. That means that this and they could have played more shows in between October 9th and June of seventy seven, but I don't think so because um, as I know from all my interviews, the band just per- played very spor- sporadically. They started to play more and started to tour late in the later years. You know, really when the classic lineup, as as I'll later talk about, you know, you have that classic lineup which is. Uh, you know uh, the, the 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 trifecta, the, the holy trinity of Glenn, Jerry, and Doyle, and whichever drummer it was at the time. That's like the classic lineup, and those guys toured more. But before that, the band sporadically, sporadically played. So I truly believe that this could have been their third performance. Anyway, they had played twice before at CBGBs in April and June. The only time that they would play together uh, there as the Misfits. Um, these CBGB, these CBGB dates, uh, two of them, the first show and the second show, uh, were talent showcases. So what Hilly used to do um, back then, you know, when Hilly started, Hilly, when Hilly started, you know, he he would just have any band playing original music come. But you know, eventually the punk rock movement is now happening. This is 1977, so now Hilly's holding uh, these showcases for up and coming bands that are unknown to to play. You know, to play play their material. Um, according to Manny, one of the reasons that they never returned, and Glenn has 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 also said in another interview, and I'm not saying this is not true. I'm sure it, it's true to some level, but this is just my opinion. I believe at that time they didn't give a shit whether they were going to get paid or not. Glenn spoke in a Rolling Stone interview, going, "Oh yeah, fuck Hilly, never paid bands or something." But it was like, dude, it was their first two gigs, man. Like, you know, th- th- it, was a, it was a talent showcase. Like, they probably knew they weren't getting paid. They probably just wanted to get up on stage. What Manny has said, and this is where I'm saying, this is the this is the differentiation. I'm not saying one is correct and one is not. It just it just it just paints the it paints the history differently. It allows you to like, and that's true with any history. It allows you to see another perspective on things. And Manny said they were they went on last. You know, it was their first and second show. Um, they never returned because they went on dead last both times, way after midnight, to a mostly empty club. Um, meanwhile, when I spoke to Sal B, which is how I met Sal B, by the way. Some of you know that I used to do rock and roll cooking with Sal B, and we met because of this documentary. I was interviewing Sal, um, and he told me about his idea for wanting to do rock and roll cooking. And I was like, let's do that, and that's how we became friends. And Love you, Sal. Um, but he talked also about being at that first show at CBGB's. I don't remember what the fuck he said. I'd have to look at the tape. Um, but there were not many people outside of guests of their friends. And they were annoyed that they would go and that they went out to, to New York City. You know, they've got to travel from Lodi to New York. It's not that far. It's like, what, 25 minutes through the tunnel. But, um, you know, they'd haul their, their gear out there. And then they would go on dead last. And there would be nobody there. They just didn't, so they, they stopped playing. And then... Uh, you know, amidst, um, uh, you know, amidst rehearsal and things, they went in and recorded uh, uh, the seven inch uh, "Cough Cool with She." Um, and you'd have to think, I would imagine that those first two shows. I believe Mark Kennedy notes this in his lineup in the lineups, which is another historically renowned document that anybody from Misfit Central goes on and on and on about because this, we just fucking obsess over this band and their lineups. And if a guy played one fucking show with the band. He was in the band. He was the, this this numbered guitarist, you know, um, uh, that they must have only played. Those two CBGB shows were played with uh, piano, bass, and drums, I believe, I think. Um, uh, okay, next. Uh, from a historical standpoint, going back to the uh, Eddie's uh, Palace, Eddie's Rock Palace uh, show. It's called Eddie's Rock Palace, I believe it's Eddie's Rock Palace. Uh, a venue that I always have heard because I read that fucking thing. Yeah, Eddie's Rock Palace uh, in Teaneck, New Jersey. Uh, from a historical standpoint, I believe this fall show at Eddie's Rock Palace in 1977 was particularly important to the evolution of their sound after listening, after listening to the fucking tape. As it seems to line up with Misfit Central's note of being Frank Licata, a.k.a. Sorry, Frank, if I butchered your last name. Frank Licata, a.k.a. Franche Comas, first show with the band. Um, at some point, uh, well, before I get there, so, you know, uh, always on in this timeline on Misfit Central, there's this 
I know this is like such fucking minutia. It's like so fucking stupid, but like whatever, man. Like this is just what we. This is what I fucking like. Fuck you. Fuck all of you. Um, at this point, uh, there was this one show where you know where when 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 Frank first came into the band, very fa very uh, well known that he played only half of the songs on the first, according to Misfit Central. He only played half the songs uh, uh, in the set. Uh, he came in. So the first set, the first half was piano, the second half was guitar. That always bugged me. I always wondered, why was that? Why did they do that? I mean, I guess maybe it's kind of obvious now, or, you know, it might be obvious to, to all of you, but to me it was not obvious. Uh, uh, the At some point, and this is, again, conjecture for me, I don't know this to be true, I've never spoken to Glenn Danzig about this shit. Um, I, mean, I suppose maybe Jerry would know, too. Uh, at some point... The band had decided to change direction from a piano-driven art rock to focus instead on laying down a bed of fast Ramones brand three-chord buzz song for melodic crooning baritone vocals to weave in and out. And that's really the, the, the springboard that this show kind of launches. Because before that, that's what it is, man. It's piano-driven art rock. That's the best way to describe who the Misfits were. You know, uh, when they were recording this Cough Cool She single, they were still very much like counterculture punk. I'm sure they would fit in, you know, they fit in with the talking heads or especially Suicide. Suicide was just a dude singing and a dude singing and playing, you know, keyboards and stuff. You know what I mean? Like, they fit in that paradigm. They're just not in the Ramones punk rock uh, and what they would have later evolved to paradigm that we know that band for. The, that, that That's what that band's signature, you know, reputation is, you know. Um... And then, you know, I had heard from another one of my interviews that a band, this was just a note, again, I don't know if this is fucking true. Uh, one guy who I interviewed said that um, this, uh, one of the, I always hear so many different fucking influences for who the, you know, Glenn will famously say, I'm supremely influenced by Black Sabbath and Elvis and, you know, doo-wop, and he talks about all sorts of shit that he's influenced. And if you listen to Skeletons, he's influenced by some of those those bands, too, you know, the bands that are on there. But, you know, Iggy Pop, Lou Reed. Um, but I, I, one thing that slips through the cracks is the Doors, man. People, like, say the Doors, but listening to the music, you really fucking hear the Doors. And, um... Uh, sorry, I lost my... Right, right, right. They, they, they switched over to... I mean, because that's what it is. The, the, the instrumentation of Misfit songs is... Just fucking, it's wonderful. It's fast, simple, Ramones esque. It's not exactly the Ramones, it's Ramones esque three chord buzz song. And on top of it, the secret weapon, the thing that makes, that we all love, the, the main instrument, is melodic crooning baritone vocals that sort of surf on this, you know, ferocious, aggressive punk rock. Um, now that voice is still very present. It's the star of the art, you know, art piano. What did I call it? Uh, Piano-driven art rock that they were before that. Um, but 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 a change, a change for whatever reason, whatever was decided. Um, I think that there was a great. I think they must have seen the Ramones, you know, the Damned, you know, all the. the I mean, this was the nineteen seventy-seven punk explosion. They they did a fucking pivot. You know, somewhere later in, in in the year of punk, which is 1977, where they're going to change things and add guitar. Uh, I'm, this is what I said next. This show must have been some sort of test or experimental transition because Frank comes in halfway through the set to play guitar on a few tracks before the band returns to piano-driven material. To my untrained musical ear. It was hard for me to tell if guitar remained later on in the set after the songs Angel Fucking Last Caress. So this early in the band, they were playing Angel Fucking Last Caress, or they had just added Angel Fucking Last Caress. As a matter of fact, because Frank came on and played guitar, I think that Angel Fucking Last Caress were brand new fucking songs that had just been written at that time. Uh, and that there are, there's this set, and some of them are fucking lost, except for this recording. There's this set of much older songs that are piano-based. Um, 
And what I'm, what racks my mind to this day, and I wish, I wish I could fucking like, like clear it with myself or whoever. Uh, and I wish I had asked fucking uh, Manny. And I didn't think to ask him at the time. I was so stupid. Why didn't I fucking ask him this? Um, I could not tell. I think Frank came in, played on those songs, and then left again. And so the songs that they played after were, again, piano. And one of those songs, I know this is, this is going to blow your minds. This blew my fucking mind. This is going to blow anybody's mind who cares as much as I do. Uh, one of those songs was Hybrid Moments. That's right. I'm not positive. Don't fucking quote me on this. But I don't remember hearing any guitar on... And if there was, you know, a great example, like... The guitar on Spinal Remains is very simple. I believe it's like one note. I'm not, I don't play any instruments, guys. I don't know. Someone correct me if I'm fucking wrong. Um, it's a very simple riff. And the same thing really with Theme for a Jackal. Um, probably because they were actually piano songs uh, that got converted to guitar songs. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's, very, it, it's very, very... Do they introduce Frank at all or do they not... Me- no. No. Um, hi, Tanner. How are you? Um, no, they do not mention Frank at all. They do not... They didn't mention Frank at all. They, I don't think any... No one was introduced. Okay? Which is why it wasn't a big deal, and this is why it was an, a transitional show, and this is why it was like an experiment, because nobody gets, nobody gets fucking introduced. It's just... Um, and that's why it didn't matter that he came in to play two songs. That's why it was like an experimental show, in my opinion, an experimental transition. Because, you know, they were like, okay, we're going to try out the new material, or at least this is what I'm thinking. They're going to try out the new material. Uh, hey, Frank, come on up. Play, you know, play the songs that we just went over in practice, you know, and then we're going to go back to what we, what's in our set. Uh, there's no 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 importance on anybody in the band to like you know introduce or not introduce because uh, this band is like fucking like still hot magma like slowly forming you know um, so he plays piano drip hold on this show must have been some sort of test or experimental transition because Frank comes halfway through the set to play guitar on a few tracks before the band returns to piano-driven material. To my untrained musical ear, it was hard for me to tell. So like I said, fucking hybrid moments, man. You're fucking playing hybrid moments without a guitar. And the thing is, and I believe, I believe that when they did Static Age, they pl- tracked everything live. But I don't know if they tracked Glenn's vocals live. And, you know, whenever you hear hybrid moments covered, ah, I really should save this for hybrid, oh, whatever, I'll just fucking, I'll probably rehash that at some point anyway. Whenever you hear hybrids moments, whenever you hear hybrids moment, hybrid moments live, whoever is covering the song can't sing it correctly. Nobody sings misfit songs like Glenn Danzig. He's the only guy who can sing these songs. That's why when Glenn fucking came back out, and, you know, people have just fucking shitted on Glenn's voice for years and years and years. You know, oh, he's fucking dried up, oh, he's washed up. And you want to know something? Then this motherfucker comes out. And, you know, maybe some of those shows, he, he was, like, not as, you know, uh, consistent with his uh, vocal performance. But he comes out, and and he ha- he sings, well, we know, because he would do Danzig and Doyle, too. He comes out, and he just fucking belts out these fucking songs like it was yesterday. Like, 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 sorry, like 1983 was yesterday. You know what I'm saying? Like, he's just fucking, he, his, whatever damage has, has happened to his vocal cords has not affected whatever level he needs to sing those songs. And he can sing them. And so I'm listening to Hybrid Moments, and the, the thought that I remember, I remember this very distinctly, was the vocal arrangement is super... No, I don't think so, man. Tanner, I don't think so. Um... I, I don't think he was introducing him, not or at least not in this recording. But um, Glenn does not sing hybrid moments the way he sings it on uh, on Static Age. And the, my theory, again, perhaps someone who's more of a recording expert than me, I'm not really an expert, could, uh, you know, Frank, I, I might have, you know, I interviewed your dad like nine years ago, and I want to interview him again. I want to follow up. I hope he's well. Please say hello to him for me. 
Um, because I have not spoken to him in years. Actually, that's not true. I texted with him after I spoke to Manny. I started texting with your dad again, and then uh, he, I think he had a there was, it was some wedding, and he was not he had whatever. I, I don't want to get into his stuff, but um, uh, yeah, no, I don't remember. I don't think I did ask your dad, and I really fucking need to. Um, I don't know if he would remember that. Frank has this amazing Frank Senior has an amazing uh, 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 memory about the original arrangement of Who Killed Marilyn where uh, they're going higher in register. The original Who Killed Marilyn goes, It ain't a mystery. It ain't a mystery. It ain't a mystery. Something like that. Um, but hold on. Getting back to hybrid moments. I, I'm getting sidetracked. Hybrid moments. So, yeah, he's totally fucking... I could ask Mr. Jim. Maybe Mr. Jim would remember. I One thing I do know about Static Age, I from, I don't again, don't remember where I heard this. People, take this with a grain of salt. Glenn did all of his vocals sitting down in a chair. He specifically insisted on sitting down. I don't know why. I don't remember where I heard that, but just that he did them sitting down. I don't think he tracked them live with the band. Maybe he did scratch with the band live, but I think he did his vocals. And so when you hear Static Age on the recording of Static Age, which I would play here, but I don't want to get like in Facebook trouble where I get reported for playing copy, wrote, writ, wrote, writ, wrote music. Um, uh, the, I mean, just when you try to sing, anybody, all of us who have tried to sing hybrid moments in our fucking car, like, <laughs> you know, you can't fucking do it, man. It's like you can't get it just right. You, you, you lose your breath. You, you have to, like, truncate it. Because maybe Glenn, when he was doing that, because the song is so demanding, as I would hear in this live show, uh, where he would sing it differently, when he went into the studio, he... He uh, changed the way, maybe he changed the way, um, uh, he, he or, or maybe he sung it as he always intended it at, in his head, where he could, because, you know, you could punch in with tape. You can't handle something, you run out of breath when you're singing. I mean, anybody knows this, even if you're not in, in, in a fucking recording artist. You know, you run out of breath when you're singing, you could just rewind the tape and then punch in at the precise moment that you need to, to hit that note in the right register in the right way. And so I wonder if Static Age, for the most part, is uh, recorded in that way. And that's why when people try to do some of those songs, they fucking can't. They can't fucking sing them. Nobody can sing them like Glenn, man. And early on, before they recorded Static Age, him singing hybrid moments with his piano, he kind of, his, his vocal arrangement is slightly different. It's almost as if he's singing it a different way because he knows he could not sing it the way he would intend to sing it on Static Age Live. Um, that was a huge sidetrack from a song that I wanted to talk to you about today, which is West End Avenue. Um, the next piece of writing, I'm just gonna, like I said, I'm going off in these long fucking tangents. This is, by the way, this is going way longer than I intended it to, but I just have so much to say that I can't stop. So I'm just going to keep going, but I'm going to save some because I'd like to do this again and it would be fun to, you know, do this again. Okay. Um. Uh, uh, plus, I'm doing the introduction to this whole thing. I probably won't do the introduction in, in the future. Um, with Frank in the band, the guitar became the main driving component of the instrumentals. Uh, as a result, it seems the piano-centric songs that didn't translate strongly enough to fit with this new punkier version of the band were tossed aside, left to die. Uh, in my opinion, again... And I keep saying this over and over again because I just know there's those fucking, you know, uh, trollish fans who are like, fuck, you're not fucking Glenn Danzig. How the fuck do you know? I don't, man. I really don't. And I'm not fucking Yuri Vaughn and I'm not any of the fucking insider guys. I don't. This is just based on, on my research and the things that I've studied. I've spoken to a lot of people, but that's it. You know? I'm not making assumptions here. I'm just making theories based on what I, the, the information that's been given to me. Um... In my opinion, this is why she and Theme for a Jackal are on Static Age, while Cough, while Cough Cool is not. Um, and also, yeah, why Cough Cool is not. Uh, and, you know, eventually they would redo Cough Cool uh, way after the Misfits broke up. Uh, you know, two funny notes. Oh, man, I don't. I should say this for another time. We'll talk about this another time, but I'm going to say this one thing. Two fun, uh, a note. Uh, in the late 80s, and my chronological, my memory with this stuff is a little rusty. There were, there was going to be a Walk Among Us 2. 
as like a reissue or as like a retrospective. There was going to be all these different things that Glenn wanted to put out, used to put out original Misfits material with Caroline Records when he first gave over the catalog. But one thing that he and Erie Vaughn did was they redid about, they redid like six songs, right? I think it was five or six songs. I don't know. Tanner, correct me. It was a bunch of songs um, that they that they redid for what eventually would become Misfits Collection 2. But they also uh, recorded a song that had never, that had been practiced by the Misfits, but never fucking recorded or played live, and that was Mephisto Waltz. So that begs the question, that begs this question, which I would love to explore with you guys on another day. If Mephisto Waltz is a Misfit song, then does that make Erie Vaughn a Misfits drummer? Um, does that make Mephisto Waltz also a Sam Hain track? Because the two guys from Sam Hain recorded the fucking song? Like, what is Mephisto Waltz? It is a crazy thing to comprehend. But again, let's not talk about that now. Nobody comment on that. What's that? That's for another day. That always like runs me around though. Um, but one of those songs that they re-recorded was "Cough Cool," uh, and I believe it has guitar uh, on it. Maybe not. Yeah, does it have guitar? Who knows? Someone answer that. Uh, "Cough Cool" on on Collection Two does have guitar, and they sort of redid it. But at the time when the band was transitioning in 1977, 78, it's like some songs got the jettison for the Static Age, right? You know, uh, so she, which has guitar uh, and sounds very, you know, it sounds like good with guitar. It's like, you know, um, fucking blah, 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 blah. Uh, it, it works well with guitar. And theme for a jackal is interesting because you can really theme for a jackal is like a fossil man because like you can hear like whoa, this is when this band, this is, must have been a very early song for this band because. You know, it's got piano on it. I don't think any other songs on Static Age have piano. And uh, and it's just like, why did Glenn decide to include Theme for a Jackal? And why did he convert... Well, we know why he con partially why he converted uh, Feline uh, Nursery into Static Age. And that had to do also with a, partially with a technical accident with the tape. And somebody bumped a console and something happened with the, the track. And Glenn, in the studio, decided to change it from Feline... Whatever. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, but Cough Cool is not included on, 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 uh, Static Age. So they recorded this whole batch of songs for Static Age and they just neglected Cough Cool, but they include, they decided to record She and, uh, you know, uh, In the Doorway, which is another really early, uh, song, as, uh, I would especially learn very recently, th thanks to, uh, Aaron... Krieger, is that how you spell your last name? Shout out to Aaron for that information. Uh, I am I am a student as much as I may seem like I'm lecturing here, which I'm really not intending to do at all. Um, it seems the piano-centric songs didn't translate strongly enough to fit with this new punkier version of the band, and they were tossed aside, left to die. In my opinion, this is why she and Theme for a Jackal are on Static Age, while Cough Cool is not. According to Manny. All right, here's the big... The big dump. According to Manny, and some of you probably already know this, uh, a third studio track from the Cough Cool session was recorded, but shelved. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, now, Glenn, when Glenn turned over the Caroline tapes, the tapes to Carolina, the masters, uh, and you've heard the whole story from Misfit Central about how they had to... <sighs> Alright, super quick. They had to... Uh, between a, a certain number of years, from the late 60s to the early 80s, maybe, or, or, or 70s, um, magnetic tape that you used for studio recording was, was manufactured in a different way, different chemical process, different manufacturing process, and it was not stable the way the older shit was. Uh, so when Caroline got the tapes, and again, I'm not... No one, I, this is what I've read from this with Central. Everybody fucking knows. This is not new information. This is no revelation. Um, but it's important to what I'm about to say. Um, when, and I know this from Tom Begowitz, a.k.a. Tom B., uh, who just put out uh, the book with uh, Umberto, uh, Scream With Me. Um, he, I, in my interview with him, because I interviewed him for like two hours, 
uh, he told me first his, from first hand the whole story about the about the, the the fiasco of trying to save these tapes. They had to digitize them, but in order to digitize them, they were very brittle tapes. Uh, so there's like this thing you can do with the tapes. You can put them in the oven. If you bake it at a certain temperature, then the tapes will hold together long enough to run them through the machine one more time in order to digitize them. Because, and this is as Tom told me, and it like my jaw hit the ground, the tapes are running through the fucking machine, getting digitized, and as they pass through the tape heads, they are disintegrating. So the tape head fucking records this shit, right? The tape head records the fucking, whatever, the, the analog signal, and then disappears. It's vaporizing. They're literally saving these things. And I don't remember, I think Glenn might have lost, I think Glenn might have lost, uh, or he never had, he never gave them the cough cool sheet tape, which had the, has the mystery third song on it, probably. But... But, perhaps, the reason why is because when he went to go dig through that tape, I've heard various stories about the state of, of, of how Glenn has kept things from time to time. Uh, but one thing that I, I uh, uh, heard, or what one thing I believe or is possible or actually lines up with something else, which I'm not going to say on air at all, because it's such terrible conjecture and I don't want to say it but um, uh, th they they never got the cough cool uh, tape Tom Tom never got the cough cool tape it was went missing and it went missing for a few different reasons possibly maybe who knows uh, but one of those reasons could very well be that the tape disintegrated or was in such poor state that Glenn maybe Glenn didn't want to share it with, with Caroline, because we just destroyed and just said it was gone. Who knows? I don't know that. I don't know that for a fact. But the other tapes were in such a poor condition that they had to do this special galvanizing process just to digitize them. And they were destroyed. So the masters, to many Misfit sessions, maybe not all of them, but the masters, to many of the Misfit sessions, do not fucking... Maybe like runoff tapes, like tapes like you make... You, you, you finish mixing a section and you do session and you do a mix-down tape of like rough mixes. Those things might still exist. I know that a lot of like the inner circle right after the Static Age songs were done, lots of tapes were circulated, um, and people I spoke to had the had the Static Age material on tapes way before any of it came out, except for the stuff that was on the Bullet single. Um, so maybe the third song uh, on the Cough Cool session is no more. Like it doesn't exist because it was destroyed completely. So there's no record of it. Um, what was used for the box set was Erie Vaughn's copy of Cough Cool Sheep. They, they they called up Erie and they were like and, and was just like and they were like Erie let, you know they digitized his his seven inch so the the only reason why anybody heard that on the box set besides the um you know the, the seven inches that were lying around was because of Erie had, gave them their their copy of of the seven inch because they wanted to include it um so there's that so this song this third studio track from the cough cool session um that was shelved for whatever reason. I, again, okay, trying to rack my brain, and again, I have to listen to the Manny tape, which I have not, the uh, the interview tape. But I believe, I believe it's very, very possible that uh, the song was uh, shelved because it, w uh, it was, a, it might have been, it was either money, it was a money reason, they didn't have enough money to uh, record the... They didn't have enough money to put a third song on the tape. I don't know if that's a cost factor in manufacturing. I don't know what it was. It was something like that. What, what, for whatever reason, it was shelved. And they and it was two... Because they could have done... I mean, they did three songs later. I don't know why that would be uh, uh, an issue. But it was shelved. And I do believe... Do not quote me on this. I believe that song is Harpies in the Night. I do believe that was recorded in the studio uh, during the Cough Cool Sessions. So that's the third song. Um... But again, I'm not sure. Okay, now, we've arrived to the main course. That's right, folks. All of this shit was a buildup to uh, analysis of West End Avenue, the song. So we're going to talk about that. I'm just talking about what I remember hearing. That's it. That's all this is. 
If you thought you were going to hear something fucking cool, no, because I don't have anything fucking cool. And if you hate me for it, well, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, but I thought this would be fun content for, for Facebook Live, so sue me. Don't sue me. Um, West End Avenue. Ready? These are my notes. Uh, as I wrote them, February 23rd, uh, 2017, 40 years after the, I, this song was recorded live. Um, another thing to explain that I did not explain, um, why does this tape exist in the first place? Very good question. This tape only exists because of Manny. Manny, you have Manny to thank for this tape's existence. Why? Because Manny, you know, football players have this practice, right? They like to uh, record their games to see, uh, and then watch them back to see how they're performing. And Manny had that exact, I don't know if Manny played football, but Jerry played football. And Manny had the exact same approach. He wanted to, he recorded a lot of their rehearsals. He recorded early live shows uh, uh, and stuff like that because he wanted to play back and hear his performance and hear, you know, how he was doing so that he could improve on his craft. Um, many people have decided that the Misfits were like a jazz trio, like because of Cough Cool She, which is just utter horseshit. Like I said, it is. It's fucking, it's definitely like art rock, piano art rock, and it is a little jazzy. If you think about it, those are three jazz instruments traditionally, piano, bass, and, and drums. So from that standpoint, maybe. But Manny's drum playing is not jazzy. People just say that. They say that in the same way that they say, oh, Sam, ha the more metal-tinged Sam Hain. And it's the same thing with, with Manny's drumming style. Again, as a non-drummer, as a non-musician, it, it did not sound uh, jazzy to me at all, man. It sounded like, I mean, his style is very different from Mr. Jim's. Um, more meat and potatoes than Mr. Jim's, but not meat and potatoes like Joey Image. You know, Joey Image is just, he's just a fucking bam bam, just like, while Mr. Jim is like riding that fucking hi hat, and then doing all those little drum fills in between. Like, you know, you blink an eye and Mr. Jim has done a drum drum fill. Um, no offense to all the Misfits drummers out there. I think uh, Mr. Jim is by far my favorite. Uh, I love them all for different reasons. And, you know, Googie is just, you know, standard, like, 4-4, four, four, same, same beat. But as Bevan Davies, who, is, uh, uh, who played with Glenn on Circle of Snakes, he did an interview with me, uh, Misfits fan, um, mentioned something that's very appropriate and something that I think um, sort of hurts Dave Lombardo. Dave Lombardo's a great drummer. I'm not saying he's not. But he, I, I think that... I think that um, I think that he plays it plays the songs too straight, man. He does like for the, these reunions. He's playing them so succinct, and that was the beauty of Googie. You know, Googie was playing them like, you know, he kind of played them really sloppy. He played them to, to to feel, to ear, and it gave the songs a more organic feel live and in the studio. And they just don't, and nobody can replicate that. Nobody tries to replicate that when they play misfit songs. That's the other thing that sounds off about misfit songs truly okay so anyway manny's drumming right so he's not a fucking jazz drummer i don't know where this jazz drumming thing came from just from listening to cough cool and cheese so much um i guess maybe on the recording it's a little a teeny bit jazzy on those two songs uh but not and you know the songs were also played live at this show and they're just slower they're almost note for note the way that they're played live, they're played on, on the record, almost note for note, except I would say the speed is slightly slower. Um, still fucking fascinating to listen to, though. All right. West End Avenue. So, small preface. Preface. In 2011, um, Jonathan Grimm, the legendary Misfits collector, he regaled me with something that blew my fucking mind, and this was back in 2011. He started sort of singing West End Avenue. And when he was hanging out at Jerry's one day, because he just hang out at Jerry's, he they were making pancakes in Jerry's kitchen. And Jerry starts humming something to Tank, to 
I don't know what to call you, Tank. Jonathan Grimm. But he asks uh, Jerry what that is, or Jerry tells him that that's West End Avenue. And at the time, what he did, what, 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 this, and I remember this. Talk about, like, important things being etched into your fucking memory. For years and years and years, I thought I had heard West End Avenue. And... Uh, and this is all that I knew. This is all that anybody fucking knew from the song. It was based on what Jim... And Jim Jim was mimicking. And now I'm just like, this is a copy of a copy of a copy. Jim mimicked... Jim was mimicking uh, uh, what Jerry was doing in his kitchen. He put up his hands like this. And he just goes... And Jim... This is Jim's version. Jim butchered what must have originally been. Because, it, you know, he's remembering something from 20 years ago. You know, to me. Um, just off his memory. Because, you know... And he goes... Uh, West End Avenue, West End Avenue. And so for years, for years and years and years, I was like, holy shit, that's what West End Avenue sounds like. West End Avenue, West End Avenue. And I would tell tons of people, whoever I could, you know, th this little nugget, you know, and someone who I'm not going to name here, but someone uh, who I later would tell about that was like, was very right in this sense. It's kind of like this oral tradition, like, you know, the way we, or, you know, people pass along, passed along folk songs in the same way, this thing that at the time I was like, this is lost to history, right? Completely fucking lost to history. And, and here it is now. And he's going West End Avenue, West End Avenue. And I'm going, fuck man. And I'm, I would just do that over and over and over to myself. And I asked, you know, I ask everybody, I would ask fucking everybody I knew, hey, hey man, do you know anything about West End Avenue? Do you know anything about Harpies in the Night? Do you know, and nobody fucking knew anything until I asked that to Jim, and he he did that for me, and that was that was all that I knew at the time. So by the way, and this is what I remember from three years ago. It's not West End Avenue, West End Avenue. It's more like. And then like And then the chorus is actually more like It's more like West End West End Avenue West End Avenue West End riff it's like uh like dun 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 no like it goes from dun 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 to like dun dun oh god it's like i can hear it so well in my head and i can't like say it it's like dun 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 whatever and then it goes back and then the bass the bass is like just very simple. The bass and the rhythm section, the bass and, and, and the drums are just like, um, it's just like ding, 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 something like that. Like ding, 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 whatever. And then the drums. And so then the thing of the drums is, all right, I'm just going to read the fucking thing. What am I fucking doing the thing for? Okay. West End Avenue feels like the beginning point for this band that still doesn't quite know what it is yet. Starting out, and then in quotes, after rehearsals, jams, and generally messing around. Because pre-1977, in 1976, and this is where everybody in Misfits nerdum starts going, um, they're like, oh, Diane's the original bassist. No, Jerry's the original bassist. But it's like, you know, before Jerry, Manny, and Glenn formed as the Misfits, as this band... There were a bunch of revolving players, including Mr. Jim. Mr. Jim was one of them. He'd, like, come in and jam. There was this guy that we've all fucking, you know, heard about and tried to track down and yada, yada, yada. This guy, Jimmy Battle. I did email with Jimmy Battle, finally. Uh, but I've never spoken to him. Uh, what else? Uh, there's Jimmy Battle. There's Diane. Diane is thanked on the back of Cough Cool. She was a friend of the band. I did speak to Diane via email, and she wrote something really fucking cool, and I really hope, I don't want to say it here, I hope to read it on camera and use it in my documentary, because uh, it's really fucking cool, and it's honest, and it's so amazing to hear from her and what she has to say. Um, so you had Diane, 
and you just had these different people that were revolving in the band, and there was probably some guitar playing, but the band wasn't a band. It was no fucking band. There was no band until Glenn, Jerry, and Manny got together and fucking made a band. And in law, you know, you read the lawsuit stuff, and Glenn has, you know, uh, made proclamations like he was using the name The Misfits as early as October of 1976. And he might have. Yes, Tanner. I That's how I started uh, messaging with him. And I think I got his email. And he just took, like, months and months to respond. That's how I found out about... And he put that on there, that he was, like, founding member of the Misfits. It's really funny. But, you know, and, and Jimmy Battle... I had always heard that Jimmy Battle was from what... Sh no, like, sh absolutely nothing that I knew about him. But I'd heard that he was a black guy. And so to see this... this, this uh, this guy on Facebook, Jimmy Battle, happened to be black. I was like, and saying he was the founder of Misses, I was like, holy shit, that's fucking Jimmy Battle. Like, that's crazy. It's crazy how that lined up. There's another early figure in Misfits, um, in Misfits Dumb, that I have, for 10 years, I tried to track down this fucking guy because uh, I wanted to hear what he had to say. Um, he's known by many names, and I'd always drop his name to try and, you know, uh, to, to people that were like, around back that time to jog their memory and everybody fucking remembered him everybody remembered his name and he's thanked on the back of 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 cough cool she uh lp and i don't know if he's dead or alive but i've always tried to fucking find this guy because he could probably tell me so much uh, uh good shit as i said west end avenue feels like the beginning point for this band that still doesn't quite know what it is yet starting out after rehearse as i that's where I, that's right that's where i went off on this tangent we were talking about the rehearsals jams and general messing around there was no guitar it was just piano, backed by a rhythm section, and West End Avenue's songwriting leans heavily on it. And that's what... West End Avenue is a piano song, then. Like, maybe he wrote it on a guitar. I don't think so. I don't think he wrote any of these songs on a guitar. Because Bobby told me about, you know, just being in Glenn's room, as I'm sure he tells everybody, you know, you, you, when you ask him a thousand questions about Glenn's basement and Glenn's room at 49 MacArthur. And, and he mentions that in Glenn's room... Uh, was the, the Fender Rhodes piano. And connected to the Fender Rhodes piano, this is what Bobby told me, is a loud, like a loud shoehorn speaker. Um, kind of like what you would find at a baseball field. Like, you know, for like, you know, annou like announcing the games. And, sorry, there was the Fender Rhodes piano. Next to it was a sort of like a childish looking like Casio, like play school sort of like record player. And connected to it was this loudspeaker thing, you know, from a baseball field that, that Glenn had probably, had, you know, ripped off, stolen, stuck on there to make it, make, you know, his record sound faster, I mean, louder. And, you know, the thing that Bobby said was, you know, uh, so Glenn had this piano in his room. That's probably where, like, he came up with a lot of songs, man. And he would just would write songs for days. He had tons and tons of fucking songs, man. And when Bobby would pick him up for practice... He said, and this is Bobby's memory, I've never heard anybody else say this, so I don't know, you know, who knows. But Bobby was like, Glenn opened up a, tr a, he had a chest, and in the chest was just tons of compositions, like paper. It was just usually a song title and, and a chorus, or, you know, like the song was, was patchy, like maybe it was still working out the song, like it wasn't totally complete. And he would pick, like, one or two from this stack of compositions, and that would be what they would play at practice. Um, somebody else told me that, you know, their memory was jogged, and they told me that, that there was a song called, there's a song called Horror Movies that just, they used to practice in 79. I've never heard anybody ever tell me about this song. I've never heard anything else. It's just what this guy know, and this guy would fucking know. This guy is an insider. He told, I think it was called Horror Movies or Horror Movie or Horror Show or something. And that was a song they used to do. Uh, they used to do a lot of songs, a lot of covers. Um, uh, more, club, uh, more covers before The Misfits. In any case. So, um, it's just a piano, it's piano backed by a rhythm section. And, and West End Avenue songwriting leans heavily on it. And that Glenn composed these songs on piano. All those early songs. A lot of the songs that I heard at this third show are fucking piano songs, man. And that's why Frank comes out halfway through to play the more the new songs that were probably written on a guitar or if they were written on a piano they were written with chords that are more adaptable guitar and those songs are angel fucking last caress 
you know, and then the rest of these songs. So, in fact, it's very possible that Hybrid Moments is actually a fucking piano song before it became, before it was adapted to be a guitar song, if you could possibly imagine that. Because when I think of Hybrid Moments, I do not think of it as a piano song at all, in any way, shape, or form. And here's where I say, although I don't know and forgot to ask Manny when I interviewed him earlier today, so this part I wrote the day that I guess I, I must have written this hours after being with him, because again, I've just been writing for a few days. It leads me to believe that West End Avenue, much like some of the other songs played live in the set, is one of their very, very earliest songs as a band. Let me qualify that. What does that mean to me, at least? It means that... W- is it the first song? No, probably not. I don't who know who could fucking know what the first song is. But it was probably in that very first batch of songs that after he was doing those jams with Diana and Jimmy Battle or whoever, that it's one of those songs that solidified them as a misfits. Maybe that's like one of the earliest songs that Manny, Jerry, and Glenn like started the band with. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so I believe it's one of those early one of their earliest songs. Um, this song also stands to reason just how much and this. I can't stress enough. This was the probably, in listening to this show, this was one of the biggest revelations for me as a fucking fan uh, and changed everything that I thought I knew about this band. If I did sit down in a room with Glenn or Jerry and they were like, but if I sat down and asked them, you know, about this stuff, they pro- or what I'm about to say, they might be like, nah, you don't know what you're talking about. And I know what I'm talking about because I lived it and I was fucking there, so fuck you. So I just want to, Put that out there when I say what I'm about to say. Um, you know, when everybody lists, you know, what what are the what are Glenn's influences musically? We always go to Elvis. We always talk about um, Black Sabbath. We talk about the Ramones. We talk. There's so many bands and things. Velvet Glenn loves to reference the Velvet Underground. Now, he always always references. He's like, yeah, Velvet Underground. Like that's what he t- like all this stuff. And Jerry on the flip side. Um, loves talking about David Bowie because he used to see Bowie and he said Bowie was the the inspiration Um, and I think Alice Cooper is is mentioned a bunch Um, but nobody really talks about The Doors it's mentioned it's always mentioned when you're listing things off like uh, Elvis, Black Sabbath The Doors because his voice is very Jim Morrissey Morrissey, not Morrissey Jim Morrison-like Jim Morrison-esque. His voice and these song, this song is a fucking door song. That's what it was. And this band was almost this three-piece art rock band driven by a piano is like, it's unbelievable how much they're like the doors. They're like the fucking doors, man. Straight the fuck up. Um, and I would say West End Avenue might be, along with two other ones that I will mention at another time, are probably their most door-like song. I mean, m- most sound like the Doors. And they're the three songs that have never been recorded, that nobody knew existed, that are lost to time, but for this recording. So, this song also stands to reason just how much Glenn was influenced by the Doors, whether he wants to admit it or not. And here's what I remember from his voice. I wrote this the day I heard it. His low-register croon has softer, more velvety feel than the biting edge it would take on with the static age material. But you can hear all of the piss and vigor underneath, just waiting to rise to the top as it would later on. And so that's what it was, man. So like when he's singing, and I don't know what the fuck the lyrics were, except the what, you know, West End of a, West End of... Um, but he's singing like, this is kind of like the melody a little. He's like... I just remember that. The like it almost all right, this is crazy. All right. I'm gonna post it here too in the comments. You know what it kind of fucking reminds me of a little bit? Just a little bit. I know this sounds really fucking stupid, but it's just how I remember it. It's just um uh let's see here. Uh Jimmy Fallon. Reading Rainbow. And you're like, what? Jimmy Fallon reading Rainbow? Like, what the fuck? This has 
a little bit of the energy that West End Avenue has, except for the part at the end where he goes, Reading Rainbow! Although he kind of does it like fucking, you know, 1988 Glenn Danzig in Danzig. Reading Rainbow! Like later on, but not, that wasn't in West End Avenue. But this sort of like, his sort of approach to take a look it's in a book, a reading rainbow. That is very much what West End Avenue is kind of like, uh, a little bit, as I remember. Um, here's where I talk about the, the music theory that I was mentioning earlier. The music revolves around two very simple piano parts and a repeating bass line. I wrote bass line, like home run bass. Bass line. Manny's drumming is fantastic and retains an odd time signature that I don't believe to be standard 4-4. Although, again, I am not a musician and I do not know if that is true. To someone who... To sum up the whole song... Okay, to sum up everything I just said. And again, I wrote... Spelled sum wrong. Written, wrote that very quickly when I wrote it. To sum up the whole song, simply, it feels like Glenn trying to write The Doors doing a weird offbeat waltz. That is what, in my opinion, West End Avenue is a weird offbeat waltz with a weird time signature that's very like reminiscent of cough. You know how cough cool is weird. Sim it's similar. Manny played with the most swing. Dave plays with no swing. Okay. Uh, what does that fucking mean? Let's fucking Google that shit. I'm guessing drum swing means like the uh, delay in, in hitting your drum, like, you know, uh, playing l looser, right? Like you're playing looser with the drums. Let's see what drum swing turns up. Straight versus swing drum beats. What is drum swing? Swing, sometimes groove or shuffle, is the addition of tiny delays to every other hit of the beat. It is used to mimic the nature, the natural sound of a real human drummer Drums are usually responsible for the overall groove of your track. I yeah yeah John I, I think you're yeah I think you're 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 right about that. I don't know if he played. Oh yeah, I guess he probably did play with the most swing. I don't know, man. I think, to be honest, I think Googie kind of played with swing, uh, a little bit in the sense of like, or at least live, because he's just sort of like, he's not. He's trying to be. Googie is trying to be a, a, a rapid fire machine. You know who was a fucking rapid fire machine, like a computer, like truly like, like uh, it's time to be an android, not a man. Is fucking Mr. Jim, because he's just like every song on Static Age is just like. Like he just, just fill after fill after fill. If you're ever trying to like, you know, drum. Like I'm, I'm not a drummer again, but like you know that. Like, just into, into you know, uh, maybe he means more of a groove. I, I, I don't know, man. I don't know, um, James. I, again, a non-musician trying to speak in musical language, man. Yeah, I guess the, the, the tiny delays. Like, I would say that Manny definitely had that. And he has it way more than Dave Lombardo, who is, yeah, Dave Lombardo is like machine drumming, you know? And he just plays the songs way too straight for my taste. Robo. Robo is like a very, uh, it's used to mimic the sound of a real human drummer. Robo, which is funny because his, his, his nickname is Robo, uh, is a real human drummer in my opinion. There's, he's, his drumming is very human. It's very organic. I think that Manny's drumming is organic. I think that uh, Joey Image is just a, a.k.a. Joey Pills, a.k.a. Joey Poole, is just a fucking power hitter, man. He's just a fucking... He just fucking hits powerfully, you know? Uh, West End Avenue, it's a weird offbeat waltz, man. That's what it is. In my opinion, that's what it is, you know? These are some thoughts based on uh, a, a question I had in my mind. Glenn knew how to play guitar at this time. But, you know, I believe Glenn started off with piano. I think piano was actually Glenn's first instrument before guitar. Don't quote me on that, but I think it was. But Glenn did know how to play guitar, and we do know that Glenn pretty much can play any fucking instrument. He plays everything. Uh, and, you know, you listen to Spook City USA and Who Killed Marilyn, and that's Glenn proving to himself and to his band that he doesn't need anybody to fucking 
record that shit, but, you know, those tracks are a little... Uh, I mean, I love the song, but those tracks are a little... Uh, uh, uh. When I was with Manny, we he had a cassette, and I had a tape deck, and I was deathly afraid because I had remembered the story that Tom Begowitz had told me, and I know tape is different than, you know, reel-to-reel tape, that, you know, quarter-inch tape that they were recording on, but I didn't know what the state of this tape was. I didn't know if the tape would get eaten. It was a weird tape deck. I didn't want, I was so deathly afraid of destroying what was ever on that tape that I felt I would almost rather not hear it than hear it and destroy it. That was my feeling at the time. Today, I totally regret it, and I wish I had played it and just heard it. And if it got eaten, then fuck all of you. I got to fucking hear that shit. You know, at least someone got to hear that shit. And I feel stupid. I think probably other people have heard that shit, to be honest, actually. I'm almost positive. Um, but, uh, yeah, there is more than one tape. Uh, and that tape might have marble index on it. might have had a bunch of things on it. Um, probably had in the doorway on it. Who knows? There's, there's, there, there's more than one tape. Anyway, getting back to my question. So based on what I'm hearing, I'm hearing all these piano-driven songs. I'm hearing these lost songs that are fucking piano songs. And the song West End Avenue, it's blowing my fucking mind. And I'm going, Glenn knew how to play guitar at this time. He knew how to play guitar because, as I recall, he taught Jerry how to play bass. Right? So he knew. And that was the thing. You know, Glenn, there were a lot of hotshot players in Lodi, but Glenn wanted people that he could mold. Glenn wanted people that uh, he could start fresh and mold into his image. And I think that's why, frankly, maybe that's that might have something to do overall with, you know, eventually getting controversially pushed out of that band because you know bobby was a fu- bobby is like a phenomenal fucking guitarist he's he's a fu- he's fucking amazing as jerry was grooming his brother uh and glenn taught fucking doyle how to fucking play just the way that he taught jerry how to play you know this was part of of, of because before the misfits there were tons of players in lodi everybody fucking played and there were really good players and they played only cover songs they could you know, do Led Zeppelin note for note, but they were fucking, they had egos. They had big egos. They wanted to be the center of the band or blah, 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 or they didn't want to get with the program. And as we all know about fucking Uncle Glenn, Uncle Glenn has a plan. And if you're not with Uncle Glenn's plan, then get the fuck out of the van. And that probably contributed to why Glenn was like, I just want guys that I, you know, bring in, I fucking show them what's what, and they fucking play. And maybe, like, somewhere along the line, at some point, you know, besides all the personality conflicts or whatever it was, that ultimately Glenn might have found it more appealing to have uh, someone he taught play guitar than this fucking hot shot, you know, virtuoso by punk rock standards playing um, guitar. Judging by what you just said, I don't think you heard the tape that I had in the door that had in the doorway. The version on that tape really backs up what you said about the Doors' influence. Almost sounds like a band doing a Misfit song in the style of the Doors. So, uh, two things, Tanner. Um, I have heard in the doorway. Uh, I'm not going to say how I heard in the doorway, but I also eventually got to hear in the doorway as well, and it is a separate tape. Um, In the Doorway was not played on that live set list. They might have scrapped In the Doorway, or In the Doorway, maybe it wasn't written. I don't know why they didn't include it. Maybe it was cut for time. Maybe. Maybe they were like, let's take out In the Doorway and instead play some of our new songs with Frank. There's many different ways that that could have happened. I didn't think that, that any other version of In the Doorway existed apart from the... Well, what we found, what was found on Static Age, but yes, in, there is another version of In the Doorway. It is kind of live, and it is also incredibly fucking Doorsy. And that's the truth, man. They are, they are fucking uh, the Doors, man. Okay, so Glenn knew how to play guitar at this time, but chose to use piano, uh, use the piano live and in the studio, which leads me to a few thoughts as to why that is. So why is it? that Glenn chose the piano live and in the studio with the Misfits instead of uh, guitar. Why is why wasn't the Misfits just like a three-piece guitar based, based drums, as it would later become with him as a, as a front man? Um, and by the way, I believe the Pony tapes, or at least in Pony, Prostitutes of New York, in which they performed in weird get-ups like scuba gear, 
they performed, uh, there were originals, but there were also covers. And some of those covers were included the New York Dolls, Lou Reed, Take a Walk on the Wild Side, um, I think the Velvet Underground, and something that they performed in the Misfits a whole bunch, uh, way before they covered it uh, with Michael Graves later on, uh, was I Gotta Write by Iggy and the Stooges. Glenn knew how to play guitar this time, but chose to use the piano live and in the studio, which leads me to a few thoughts as to why that is. Why does Glenn use piano instead of guitar? That's what I'm trying to say. One, Glenn simply, compo Glenn simply composed the songs on a piano, not guitar, and chose in turn to play piano live. Again, for whatever reason, maybe... And, you know, I didn't put this down here, but I think... You know, we've heard Glenn play live a little bit, but I don't think he's very much of a live player. Like, he he plays in the studio and stuff, but he doesn't really seem, you know, uh, maybe it's the way he holds the guitar or whatever. It just doesn't, he, it's kind of, he's kind of awkward when he plays guitar. He's better as a, you know, mic holding front man, which is what he is. He just simply composed the songs on the piano. That's it. N nothing else. Yeah, so he's playing them on piano. Uh, two. Glenn's original idea for the band was not what it would be, what it would become, not became, become. Glenn's original idea for the band was not what it would become. Meaning that when Glenn started the Misfits and when he was jamming and blah, 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 blah perhaps uh, he saw it as that art rock thing, that, that, that trio, just that, that uh, guitar, sorry, that uh, piano, bass, drums trio and nothing fucking more. That's it, man, right? Like, you know, uh, uh, it's not, not, not like something like what it would become. Uh, and that's why he played it on piano and that's it. Number three, this original incarnation of the band was a live show playing recording group as all other versions were. But every time they changed personnel until 1980, the, uh, the band evolved both musically and visually as it got more and more involved with the New York punk scene of the late 70s. The truth is, this may be a controversial statement for Misfits nerds, but it's what I believe. The truth is, the Misfits is really four-ish bands in one. More on that later. Uh, but I'll touch on that now. Yeah, I, I think that the Misfits and, you know, Devil Man, I think, has said this before in the Seventh House group. Like, to Glenn... It's it's all Glenn Danzig's, you know, songwriting, right? So it's like he's he's always been the 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 the, the nucleus of of the group. So for him, it's just jumping from one thing to the next to the next to the next, and it's never been about the personnel much. Although I would, for him, he thinks that, but for me, I disagree because I'll tell you something: Danzig and Doyle doing Misfit songs was fucking phenomenal, but it was nothing like Glenn, Jerry, and Di and and Doyle doing those Misfits songs. Jerry adds so much to the Misfits equation, it's not even funny. But in Glenn's mind, you know, it's like Glenn. The, it's like, I'm Glenn. These are my fucking songs. And I'm doing another project. Okay, let me get four new guys. Another, you know, it's just everything is, is an evolution of before. Danzig is just the most modern evolution of the Misfits. I don't agree with that. I think every time they change personnel... Because each member brought a fucking flavor to this band. You know what I'm saying? Like they, they, you know, they they brought their they brought their own their, their own flavor, their own visual. I mean, especially with Doyle. Doyle brought a whole fucking visual look that Bobby Steele didn't have uh, uh, at all. You know what I mean? My Twins of Evil. You know what I mean? The 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 the, the Trinity, man. The, the 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 triangle, the phalanx. It's like fucking mad scientist with his two brooding fucking, you know, Frankenstein monsters on the left and the right. You know what I mean? Um, different band. The classic lineup. Much different band from Cough, Cool, She. So, the original, uh, uh, so going back to, you know, uh, uh, number two, you know, the original idea for the band was not what it would become. And so, it's like, it's like this, this thing that evolves. So, it starts off on the piano. So, that's why Glenn's playing piano. That's why he's writing songs on the piano. And then he's like, no, this it's actually this. So, for me, I think that the band, like I said, is four-ish bands. I think, and I label them by releases, man. You have the Cough Cool Band, which is, you know, Manny, Glenn, and Jerry. Then you have the Static Age Band, which is... Franche, Mr. Jim, 
uh, Glenn and Jerry. Uh, then you have the horror business band, which is uh, by many, especially of, of recent, is people love that fucking lineup. Um, and it's what that's where the horror shit really fucking comes in because the Static Age had some horror, but it was still more, I don't know, it was more like, it was more 77 punk, if that makes any sense, than it was horror. But the horror elements really come in in 19, late 1978, 1979 with the horror business band. They get the Crimson Ghost. They start growing out their fucking devil locks. They all start wearing the, the, the Ramones uh, leather jackets. You know, that's when they became, uh, that's when the fucking horror shit really happened. And before that, you know, Glenn thanks Bukowski on that Cough Cool record. And he thanks Bukowski because Glenn was very much influenced by Charles Bukowski in his fucking writing. Charles Bukowski was a beat poet. A lot of the songs on Static Age are beat poetry put to music. You know what I'm saying? Like, so after the Cough Cool Band uh, sort of uh, evolves into the Static Age Band, you know, with the addition of Frank and the replacing of, of Mr. Jim with, with, Man, or with Manny with Mr. Jim... They're, they're playing, you know, fast, punk, buzzsaw punk rock, but Glenn's lyrics, which extend from that cough, cool, that cough Cool era, are all sort of like these, like, you know, like, think about, like, the lyrics to Cough Cool, and even look at, like, She. They're just, they're poems, man. Bullet started off as a poem. You know what I'm saying? It's all fucking, like, beat poetry. Like, think about TV Casualty. Like, breaking that shit down. Um, TV Casualty, uh... Uh, there are paint smears on everything that I own. The vapor, the vapor rub is lying on a table of filth. Christmas cards to which I never replied. My eyeballs absorb only blue filtered light. It's like, it just sounds like beatnik poetry. Um, I wish they'd put Prince Namor on the tube. Hold on, I think I have to puke. There's a spot in the corner where I always go. I like to feed the flies that I know. It's like there's like a little bit of horror tinged stuff, but it's really more like pop culture. Um, and this is my one of my favorite, you know, lines. Babies in prison, they call it a womb. Nine months the sentence, no parole. Slivers of steel stuck in her lungs, breathe deep. We need a donor for blood. You know, uh, and I think Static Age, the song Static Age does that as well. And Theme for a Jackal does that, you know. Dead daughter in the river, entrance gained by her liver. That was some uh, one of my interviews subjects turned me on to that lyric. Really drove it home for me, you know, as to as to just like sort of what he's doing there. So that's like this is a band that's very inspired. This version of the band is very inspired by like fucking poetry. Bullet, or no, we are one thirty eight. Do you think we're robot clean? Does his face look almost mean? It's time to be an android, not a man. What does 138 mean? Shut the fuck up. I don't want you to know what 138 means. It's my artistic fucking statement. My David Lynch artistic statement where I don't want you to know what the meaning of this fucking thing is. I don't want you to know what this means. So shut the fuck up. It's about violence. Fuck you. Um, and then all of a sudden, 1979, horror business. It all becomes all about horror business. That's the third incarnation of this band. And then... Doyle comes into the picture, and we get the classic lineup, the devil lock forms. They become these muscle-bound muscle guys, and that's what everybody in my interviews remembers them as, these muscle-bound guys. They weren't always such muscle-bound guys. They were more skinny in leather, black, all black sort of guys. And then they became, you know, started wearing wrestling pants and, and took off their shirts and fucking were just, just had this fucking, this look, I mean, this, 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 this ferocious look in addition to the music they're playing. And they're starting to get faster and faster and faster. And then when Robo joins, they infuse a black flag drummer into their sound. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, um, they become fucking hardcore. They start playing with all the hardcore bands. Let me ask you a question. There's very few bands, like, uh, here's one example. Um, fucking the Dead Kennedys is an example because they're you know what they they were around from 1977 to 1984. I think Black Flag is a good example, but none of these bands evolved from musical genre or musical style to musical style and musical style the way the beat, the, the Misfits did. They survived the the punk '77 explosion because all those bands from '77 to '80 kind of died out. Then there was the interim where they played with bands like the Mad, the Stimulators, and the Bad Brains at Max's Kansas City. 
and you know the, and that evolved into fucking what became known as hardcore punk and by the end they're fucking influenced by all the Boston and DC bands and they make their album which is supposed to be this dark slow atmospheric vision that Glenn originally wanted all of a sudden they're fucking just speeding through these fucking songs you know as uh, Alex Story said in his interview I think this is what he said in his interview Doyle Singer uh, who I interviewed many years ago for this project he said Earth AD is like one song in nine parts and I totally fucking agree with that shit and it's just nothing sounds like that fucking song I mean nothing sounds like that that fucking record it's so fast this band has like evolved man over time Glenn has never been much of a live guitar player except for the Sammy days on Archangel and the first live show at the Rock Palace in March of 1984. So even after that 84 show, as we've seen uh, recorded, Glenn, you know, jump, jumps on, uh, Glenn jumps on uh, uh, guitar uh, and, and, and for some reason there's two bass players. It's so weird. Erie and Damien are fucking playing <laughs> double bass while Glenn plays guitar. And he's doing Archangel. And, you know, it's kind of awkward, man. He's a little awkward holding the guitar. It's just not natural for him. It doesn't feel very natural. It doesn't feel like uh, his instrument. His instrument is a microphone, uh, in all honesty. Even though he wrote the music, it just doesn't work. It does, that's why he, he, he keeps the, the, the template that he keeps. Um, during the Misfits days, he would casually play guitar during informal gatherings, like the Jim Morrison tribute night at Max's Kansas City. Or the Studio Zero, which we've all seen on YouTube in a million different places in 1979. Studio Zero is a recording. Somebody was recording on VHS. It's Howie Pyro from The Blessed. I forget who else is there. Uh, and just Glenn and Jerry. And Glenn is on guitar and Jerry's playing um, bass. Just the way that Glenn was on guitar at Max's Kansas City for the Jim Morrison tribute night. And um, But they weren't playing as the Misfits. That wasn't the Misfits. They're just jamming. And so in a jamming atmosphere, Glenn feels okay throwing a guitar around his neck and just jamming it. If someone's recording it, they're recording it. He wasn't expecting that. Um, but when presenting as the Misfits, the image, he seemingly wanted to keep, uh, keep followed the same template of bands that he took some heavy, heavy influence from. Black Sabbath and the Ramones. Guitar, bass, drums, fronted by a magnetic lead singer frontman. When the project evolved from the Misfits to Sam Hain, he flirted again with the idea of playing guitar live, only to scrap it. So, to bring this around to my initial question and point, um, at some point, and at this show really, this, this, this historical pivot for the band to go from uh, a three-piece with piano, b uh, bass, and drums to adding a guitar and dropping the piano... Um, they, you know, Glenn decides to, to ditch it and become this frontman and become, you know, uh, what the Misfits would, would eventually, and the band evolves. So this band, it's a different fucking band. It's like, it's, and, and that's why, and in ditching the piano, in singing these songs live, he's ditching all the songs that are piano heavy and require more, um, they require, uh, uh him playing the piano live, you know, like, the guitar doesn't, and uh, combine this with the fact that he's got these guys, some of some of which, not all, but some of which he's teaching how to play, you know, or rudimentary players, or whatever you want to call them. He's, he has these guys come in uh, that are not the uh, 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 big, big, big time players around the Lodi circuit um, playing, you know, he, he's simplifying things, you know, he's simplifying everything from the more nuanced piano songs. Again, not a musician. Who knows if that's fucking real? Um, five. And this is what I mentioned earlier. As I've heard, Devilman, uh, a.k.a. Maurice. Shout out to Devilman. What's up? Uh, as I've heard, Devilman and others say, it has always been uh, one band that reinvented itself over and over again, whether it was changing its name or not. Uh, basically saying that, you know, um, Glenn, the Misfits are just the first version of what Danzig would become and that it's just evolved. And it's always been Glenn's band with Glenn's songs and the, the people have changed and that's it. So it's like this thing that evolved from, from the Misfits to, from all the versions of the Misfits to Sam Hain, which largely remained the same to uh, uh, Danzig. Uh, and then you have all the different versions of Danzig. Cause you know that again, I love the current lineup of Danzig, um, but it is not, 
the classic lineup of Danzig. Two different bands, man. Kind of. I mean, it's different bands. I have to say. It's the truth. Um, uh, and so even with the Misfits, you have this version of the band that existed before it became influenced by punk. You know? That doesn't say that it's not punk. But it just was more... It, it, it was just not as... It became... When they add the guitar, they were like, we need to adopt to the New York 1977 punk sound. Look, at this is what the Ramones are doing. This is what the Damned is doing. You know, um, let, let's not... I, I don't want to be this. I want to be this. I'm not, I don't want to be the talking heads. I want to be this. Um, and so this show, in hindsight, in a way, is a very big turning point when everything changed, you know? Because the next show they would play, there would be no piano. Um... It, they would just be what the, it would be the template that would be forevermore all the way to this day with Danzig. Six, even though these songs are based on a jazzy, oh, I, we already talked about this. Even though these songs are based on a jazzy art rock instrumental approach, they are still very short, maybe one and a half to two minute tops. That's right. So all these fucking songs are short as fuck, these door songs. And generally, door songs are like seven fucking minutes. Not, I mean, not all of them, but I mean, so many of them, man. Like, a song, I guess West End Avenue is also kind of like the Alabama song. In terms of, like, the Alabama song, it feels like this. If 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 West End Avenue is like a weird uh, waltz, then this is like, then Alabama song is like this uh, bar song. Like, oh, show me the way to the next whiskey bar. But it's like, that is a five-minute song. And West End Avenue couldn't have been longer than two minutes. Maybe it was a minute and a half. It was just a very short song. And all of the songs that were never recorded, all the early songs that are lost to time and only like live on these tapes, are just very fucking short songs. And the thing to note is, even though they are the fucking doors, even though they are the doors, um, they are totally fucking punk. They have such a punk attitude, despite their seeming unpunkness, as you can hear on that first seven inch. Because Cough Cool and she are fucking punk as fuck, even though they're not. Like, imagine them playing Cough Cool and she. Imagine them trying to play Cough Cool in 1983 with Black Flag and the Necros. It would just be fucking weird. They scrapped even that the earlier songs, and as you can see later in the Misfits, you know, timeline of the original Misfits incarnation. They started scrapping earlier songs. A lot of the Static Age songs started to, to, to push away. They stopped doing Come Back. You know what I mean? Like, they couldn't do... They, they started um, moving faster and faster. The, and, and as the, the vision of the band evolved and changed, so did the material fall wayside. And so these piano songs on this live record are like this only... This, this, this air pocket in the fucking amber <laughs> from the Dinosaur Age. I'm like, whoa! These things did exist. Now, I'm not going to talk about them now, but I will say this. Um, and I do believe maybe somewhere you can find... I might have listed the set list uh, somewhere uh, on Facebook a long time ago. But the set... But West End Avenue, I believe... Again, I'm not sure I... There's a chance I did not hear Harpies in the Night. I think I did. Uh, someone else told me that was not the case. Don't know. Um, Harpies in the Night and Feline Nursery which we all knew about, we've known about for years from Mr. Central. Besides those songs, there were more surprises. Two, to be exact. Two or three? Uh, two. There were two surprises um, that blew my fucking mind. And this I had the gumption to ask Manny when we were listening to the tape. I'm like, what the fuck are these songs? And I've never heard and no one's ever spoken about them. It was a revelation. Listening to this for the first time was, was discovering, it was like discovering the lost city of Atlantis. Um, there were two other piano-based songs. One was called Infant Stranger, and one was called Lullaby. And they are both unfucking believable Like, I asked him, I'm like, what's next? He's like, this one's Lullaby. And I'm like, what the fuck does it, Lullaby? What the fuck does lullaby sound like? And for Infant Stranger, there was it's, Infant Stranger starts off, and I'm like, what is this song? I don't know what this song is. And he goes, 
it's Infant Stranger. And then all of a sudden, as Glenn is singing, I can understand that he's singing the word over and over again, Infant Stranger, Infant Stranger. And I'm just going, nobody knew these songs existed. And it just goes to show you that if you think you fucking know everything, you fucking don't know shit. None of us know shit. Like, and it's just amazing that, that this stuff survived 40 years on these tapes. And I'm just, like, glad that I got to, like, I'm glad I got to fucking hear it. I hope someday everybody gets to hear it. I hope this shit gets released the right way, officially, someday. And I hope everybody gets compensated the way they're supposed to, and I hope that it all fucking works out. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah. We've got a new sticker deal at Riot Stickers. That's right, folks. We are starting a brand new promotion here at RiotStickers.com, and it is for die-cut stickers. <laughs> What exactly is die cut? What does it mean? It's time for Sticker Science 101. Basically, you got your regular stickers, right? But we introduce a new element with the die cut sticker. Basically, what you do with a computer-guided scalpel. That's right, computer-guided scalpels. Isn't that a great band name, computer-guided scalpel? I love it. You can cut the exact shape of whatever your design is. So whatever you got going on, whatever its borders are, there's no borders, there's no limitations. You take your computer guided scalpel and you just cut around the edge and you get, voila, a die cut sticker. So in addition to the UV coating that protects from the sun, in addition to being printed on vinyl, which makes them weatherproof and waterproof, you can now have the exact shape that you want. Well, you always could, but you couldn't for a price like this. For $69, you can get 200 die-cut stickers. There are some people out there who are die-cut fanatics. They need die-cut stickers in their lives. You are not going to find a better deal than this. Now, there's only one place you're going to find this incredible die-cut sticker deal for $69. 200 stickers for $69. And that's if you go to the link down in the description. You go to riotstickers.com backslash from us. That's riotstickers.com backslash from us. What, Sharpie Riot, have you lost your mind? Have you lost your mind? These prices are insane. These prices are Crazy Eddie level prices. If you know Crazy Eddie, then you might be old. You might be older than me. You're probably way older than me. You click on the link, you do the thing, and you get your die cut stickers. Do not hesitate to get this deal, okay? And without further ado, future Jeff, roll the 60-second Riot sticker commercial. Go, do it. flashing back to February of 2017, where when I listened to this show, I told you all about it last week. So I'm, I'm sitting with Manny. We're listening to the show. Uh, we've just finished listening to West End Avenue, right? I'm going out of order here. This is song number four. West End Avenue was number three in the set, but I'm going for the more, the, the, I think the shit that everybody wants to know about, the lost songs. This one also might be a little controversial, as I will explain. So let's go back to the year 2012. Um, I flew down to Florida. Back when I went to interview Joey Image, I interviewed someone else. I had to make that trip worth it. Joey Image was a big get, but I needed to get some other people too. So I did. I interviewed uh, Dave Scott from Adrenaline OD. And I also interviewed uh, this other guy who used to play in bands with Glenn before he was he formed the Misfits. He was around on the Lodi scene. Um, he is, uh, I believe he played in Kudat and Bujang. It's not who dat and Boojang as mis misheard when when Mark Kennedy's listening to that or, or or talking to Glenn he misinterprets Glenn Glenn 
says something like who dat and Boojang, and he thinks he says who dat Boojang. Uh, so, 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 uh, this guy was a part of that project. Um, not Mr. Jim. I believe Mr. Jim was also in Kudat and Boojang, but it's not Mr. Jim. Going on eight years now, I visited someone who used to play with Glenn in his previous band before the Misfits. This is my notes. I was particularly excited to speak to him for many reasons, but most of all, I thought maybe he would remember or know the origin of one of the three law songs from Misfit Central. Super recap from last week. If you go into the Misfit Central timeline, Mark Kennedy from that same interview, I'm assuming, mentions Feline Nursery, West End Avenue, and uh, motherfucking Harpies in the Night. These three songs that we've never heard. The, the, the golden holy grail for Misfits fans to hear. He did not know Feline Nursery, but friends, again, if you're unfamiliar with last week's broadcast or if you're unfamiliar in general, if you listen to Spinal Remains, Spinal Remains is the evolution of Feline Nursery. Uh, Glenn turned Spinal uh, Feline Nursery into Spinal Remains. Um, which he did not know Feline Nursery, which led me to believe that perhaps it was fairly new by the time they were playing it live in 1977. So going back to the 1970 show, perhaps Feline Nursery was actually a relatively new song, and that's why uh, this guy was not as familiar with it. It also makes me think that perhaps this old song, and perhaps maybe one of the song, Harpies in the Night, perhaps it was dropped from the Misfits material because it might have been a song from that previous band. Maybe Kudat and Bujang used to perform Harpies in the Night. I never asked him that. I wish I had. Should have asked him. It is also possible that he simply didn't remember the song re re regarding Har Feline Nursery. He also did not know West End Avenue. So maybe West End Avenue, Glenn pulls out the keyboard and he's writing the song West End Avenue, one of the early, you know, at that beginning when he's when he started the Misfits. It's possible that West End Avenue could be a song f as early as 1976. Uh, but here is, here's the crazy part. He did, uh, seem to recall Harpies in the Night. I went, I asked him, I was like, do you remember a song called Harpies in the Night? And he goes like this. He goes like this, kind of like what I kind of felt last week. He just sort of like looks off, he thinks for a moment, and he goes, yeah. He goes, yeah. And then he says... But he seemed, I, this is what I wrote, but he seemed to recall Harpies in the Night and proceeded, after a moment of pause, to recall something from almost 40 years back. And then he sang this to me. <laughs> Ready for this? He sang, he goes like this. Sing like harpies in the night, in the night. That's all he did. No, nothing more. Just sing like harpies in the night, in the night. And I was just like, oh, what? I was like, wait a minute. And he's like, yeah. And he wasn't like, it wasn't like the 100%, but he just, he did that. He fucking did that. And much like when when Jonathan Grimm, a.k.a. Jim the Tank Dorsey, a.k.a. Tank, sang West End Avenue after he heard Jerry do it in his, in 1994 in Jerry's Kitchen when they were making pancakes. West End Avenue. West End Avenue. Um, here's this guy going, sing like harpies in the night, in the night. I left that interview, and much like the West End Avenue thing, I'm telling everybody, hey, sing like harpies in the night, in the night. Sing like harpies in the night, in the night. And I'm just like imagining what this song could have been. What was it? Sing like harpies in the night, in the night. Um, I took that everywhere with me. It was a revelation and for years would be uh, what I thought the closest I would get to hearing the song until February of 2017, sitting with Manny, listening to his tape, dot, dot, dot. Um, but yeah, that was a really cool thing. And I, yeah, I would tell people for years, it was like this little trivia currency that I had because, you know, every Misfits nerd like myself is like, I know more about the band than you know more about the band. And this is real. <laughs> oh, yeah. What about this? Oh, yeah. What about this? Ian says, somehow bits of lyrics for the Lost Songs were on Misfit Central. Always added intrigue to the legend. I believe what Ian is, is referring to is when Mark Kennedy uh, record, uh, wrote that timeline, he... He mentions with Feline Nursery, uh, he quoted the song beginning with, I'm going to throw away the key to my Feline Nursery. And, but nobody knew where that fit into the song until now. 
Nobody knew where that fit in. They just knew it was, I'm going to throw away the key to my feline nursery. And I can tell you, it comes at the beginning of the song. Instead of, I might as well just spoil it. Instead of going, uh, this is unreally sex, this is unreally love. Da, 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 da. It goes, I'm going to throw away the key to the feline nursery. Da, 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 da. Um, good, good, Denise. Sing it forever. Let it spread, man. Although, don't sing it quite yet because there's more to that story coming, coming up, man. There's more to that story. Uh, but it's still fun to sing and it's still fun to think that, like, uh, you know, like, that that was the song. Sing. Because couldn't you imagine Glenn just going, like, sing like a business. Like, just, like, really belting it out Elvis style. But he wouldn't have belted it out Elvis style. He would have belted it out Jim Morrison style, as per what I've heard. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to throw away the key to the feline nursery. And it's more like that. It isn't like, you know, it's a lot more, like, it's a lot more uh, dirty, fast, snotty on Static Age. This isn't really sex. This isn't really life. This isn't really anything I like. It's just more like, I'm going to throw away the key to the feline nursery. Get on the floor and whisper my name. Away. Like that. And, um, yeah, it's really fucking cool, right? So, okay. So now now going on to the next part. This This is the part that makes my brain hurt. So this is my thoughts on the day. I guess this was on my thought. This is one of the thoughts on on the day when I wrote down my notes in a in a fever in a fevered urgency. Right, um, my brain is still trying to process that I've actually just heard the lost song West End Avenue. I was very underprepared for the next bit of information that would come moments later, as the tracks were changing. The next track on the CD begins. Glenn says something at the beginning. Uh, and this is what, okay, and then this has, this is one of those things that just, like, I just rack over and over in my brain that I've been thinking about and thinking about and thinking about. And it's so nice to talk to someone about it, like, talk and, like, talk about this with other people. I don't know, just, like, like, like just say it, like, this is just what I've been thinking about. Um, Glenn says something at the beginning, and it's something like, this is to go drive me, or this used to be drive me, or... This is the girl drive me, or this is go drive me. Um, I can't, I can't feel, it was so gar, you know, the tape is very listenable, and there's some things you can hear very clearly, and there are other things that you just don't. Like on any classic, you know, come on, all of us, all of us have heard, misheard Misfits lyrics over the years. Uh, just look at, you know, the, the Misfit, the lyrics on Misfit Central, uh, uh, this is the genie of your death for Green Hell. Uh, just ridiculous. I think J uh, James Hetfield, there's like some YouTube clip of James Hetfield talking. Somebody post that in the, in the comments below for everybody. Uh, uh, James Hetfield is going like, uh, uh, was Glenn like, is Glenn playing a dog in us with these lyrics? This here in, here in the eye is the genie of death or something. Uh, you know, it's just like totally mishearing these lyrics. And then when the lyrics book, the lyric books came out and we got to hear what, what he's friggin' really saying on Wolf Blood. Holy shit. Holy shit, what a dark song about turning into a werewolf. Holy fuck. Glenn loved to write about turning into werewolves. Um, you don't know who I'm talking to. No one ever did. Wow. Blows my mind. Okay. Um, so it's kind of hard to hear some things. So yeah, but he's saying like this, this is to go drive me. This is to go drive me. This used to be drive me. This is a girl drive me. However, um, it was only afterwards. When I asked Manny, he said it was harpies in the night. Wow. Got to hear harpies in the night. Uh, now, here's the thing, though. I've been told elsewhere this is, in fact, not harpies in the night, but rather something else. And someone with good authority told me this. So I really, I could be very wrong. I could be very wrong with everything I just said. Like I said, uh, I really don't have, I mean, the guy, the guy who I spoke to at the time, you know, told me that this was Harpies in the Night. I believed it was Harpies in the Night. I still think it's Harpies in the Night. Um, I'm almost positive Glenn says Harpies in the Night, like, uh, in the chorus. But what the fuck do I know? Um, to reiterate what I said last week, I think this is important to note. I, I am not an expert, man. I'm not. I am just a fucking fan. That's it. Uh, I've been told elsewhere this is in fact not Harpies in the Night, but rather something else. Uh, so maybe the song uh, was dr called Drive Me at one point. 
if that third cough cool session track was indeed Harpies, is it possible that Glenn wanted the crowd to know that the song used to be called Drive Me and had a name change? By that point in October, they would have already recorded Harpies over the summer. Is it possible that the song did used to be called, before it was Harpies in the Night, maybe it was called Drive Me, and they changed the name to Harpies in the Night in the same way that Feline Nursery turned into Spinal Remains. And he's letting the crowd of, you know, five people or whoever's in the audience, you know, probably like nobody, but to Glenn is everybody, because it's his audience, when they're just beginning as a band, he wants to let everybody know that it's the song is uh, used to be called Drive Me. This used to be Drive Me. That, I don't know, it, it could, it does, it could make sense. Who knows? If this song is not Harpies in the Night, and this song is, uh, in fact, a song called Drive Me, another lost song called Drive Me, then um, perhaps that's why um, the, the, the other guy sang Sing Like Harpies in the Night, and that turns out to be the truth. Like, that is, in fact, that, that both people are valid. Because if this is Harpies in the Night, then it makes what that dude who I interviewed, it, it makes everything he said invalid. Because that mean, cause this song does not go, sing like harpies in the night. Or as Ian says, scream like harpies in the night, in the night. And perhaps there's another recording out there where they say, it, where it's a lot easier to hear, scream like harpies in the night, in the night. Although, as I'm going to get into with this song, it sounds like he's saying harpies in the night. That's what I heard. I don't know, man. Maybe I just desperately want to hear. You know when you want to hear lyrics a certain way, you hear them a certain way. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm making a meal out of very, very little information when you really think about it. Um, the song starts with a plodding two note bass line. Dum, 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 dum. I wrote dum, 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 but it's like dum, 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 dum. And that on the tape is when, uh, where the song starts to kick in. And, and, and Manny said to me while we were listening, uh, and he said it very proudly. He was like, Oh, you've never heard this song. Uh, and he had every right to be proud because, you know, if it wasn't for him, this long, this lost song only exists because of him, you know, at least as we know it currently, you know? So the song starts off with the plodding two note bass line. Doom, 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 doom. Whoa, Ian, you're blowing my mind. It's been a long time since I read that, that timeline. The song was performed at some of the early Misfit shows in 1977 before front, Franche Coma joined the band. The chorus lyric was, we scream like harpies in the night. We scream like harpies in the night, in the night. Sing like harpies in the night, in the night. We scream like... Someone should just make that song anyway. Like, musicians out there, like, someone write, write that. Just write, put that in your fucking... Reconstitute that song. Um, very cool, Ian. Thank you for... Um, Thank you for finding that. That is great. This lost song only exists because of Manny, at least as we know. And then uh, I go off on a tangent here, but I'm going to I'm gonna go off on this tangent because it's pretty interesting. Real quick. Um, who knows what else Glenn has been sitting on, right? He seems to paradoxically uh, both value and devalue stuff like this. Um, I've heard rumors that, you know, Glenn, a lot of Glenn's, Misfit stuff is kind of in disarray. What he has left of it. I don't know. I, I Again, all here to say, I don't really fucking know. I don't know. I don't know. Anybody who's listening, I don't know. Um, that it, everything's kind of in disarray. And it would kind of like make sense with the, with the thought process of like, you know, um, when Glenn turned over the Caroline tapes and they wanted everything. You know, that was part of the deal as they were negotiating. And... He turned over uh, all this material to Caroline, and as I said, Caroline essentially saved all of the Misfits catalog by digitizing it as it was disintegrating. What else did Glenn have? Like, what else was what else was what else was Glenn sitting on? You know, think that Glenn was kind of like I mean, from what people tell me about Glenn, he had a basement full of shit. We've seen pictures of his basement, tons of action figures. He just had a basement full of cool shit. He had comic books stacked to the ceiling. He had um, books, he had, you know, uh, VHS tapes, he just had all this sort of stuff. He probably had tons of home recordings of, of stuff that he had made, uh, song experiments, stuff that he probably thought was not commercially applicable to Caroline, who's trying to put out Misfit stuff. Caroline's trying to make something that would eventually become the Static Age album and the box set, right? 
And so, you know, they're sort of like picking what is what. And I can tell you, maybe I should save that for another day. I can tell you that I have personally heard at through the graciousness of a man that will remain nameless, but a fucking cool fucking guy. I have heard alternate takes to a lot of songs from those sessions. That's right, motherfuckers. You want to hear some kind of hate, but with a more Elvisy vocal? Because it motherfucking exists. Um, it's pretty fucking cool. Um, there's a reason why uh, Teenagers from Mars and Children in Heat begin and end the way they do. Um, because they're supposed to full fuse into each other. They're supposed to uh, naturally, when they're being played live, go from one into the other one. That's how they worked it out live. All this stuff that I discovered. So, point being is that when I listen to alternate takes of Children Heat and Some Kind of Hate and stuff like that, it made me realize there is so much more shit that we just don't know about. As I said last week, we think we know everything. We don't. There's so much shit. There's these Manny tapes. There's, there's so much going on. So, who knows what else Glenn had recorded, you know? Um, uh, he felt some of his other... Perhaps... Again, speculation here, not saying I know the answer. Perhaps he felt that some of his other material wasn't needed or unnecessary or not up to snuff, like the studio masters that were being presented, that would eventually be presented in the box set. Um, some, and this is, this is a more generalized statement, right? Sometimes people don't see, and by people I mean artists, people don't see the complete value of something because they are looking at one quality instead of another. A great example. Jerry talked about how he wanted to put an alternate take of Bullet on the box set. Yeah, man, I'm telling you, there is a lot of extra shit. Look at the outtakes, that outtakes track, Ian, on on the, the last bonus track on uh, the Static Age um, on the Static Age record. There's like all these in, little snippets of just there's tons of shit that we have not heard. Musicians, uh, artists, filmmakers, some they don't see the complete value of something because they're looking at one quality instead of the other. Perhaps they're looking at aesthetic quality. Uh, oh, I recorded this song on my phone, and it's really tinny, and it's not how I want to be represented. I'd much rather someone only hear the studio recording, but I'm going to self-edit myself and not include th this original outro and uh, this original intro to the song. So it gets lost to time, and it only exists on the tinny iPhone recording of whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's the mindset of, of artists. Perhaps Glenn has these tapes, or has material, or has songs, or has songs written down, or has... Just, just stuff that he was like, you know, this doesn't really, this doesn't really cut the mustard. I'm not going to send this to Carolina. I, you know, um, musicians want themselves to be represented in a certain way as uh, any artist really. And artists have a way of self-censoring or editing themselves so that they can appear how they want to be perceived to the public. Even if Glenn was kind of over the misfits and fully into Sam Aim and then eventually Danzig, he still probably put enough he still put enough thought and care uh, to make sure these things were released. You know, the box set, even though the box set, you know, did not, th those releases did not come out. He would later say, oh, that's not how I wanted it to be at all. You know, he had a lot of gripes about that, but he still wanted them to come out. He still wanted there to be a Misfits box set, whether it was for m money or not. And, and it still had to, you know, look a certain way, you know. Uh, Glenn has always said, and the truth, and here's here's a great, okay, here, wow, this just came to me. Here's a great example of this that we've seen in later in Glenn's career. Glenn, in 2007, drops the lost tracks of Danzig. They recorded four different versions of When Death Had No Name. They recorded Trouble endlessly. They would keep recording songs, and they were never, it was never perfect enough. And so they would put these things on the shelf, and they had so much extra material, they released a double album of it. And so it's like, man... You know, if that, you know, if that's Glenn's and that that lines up with what Bobby Steele told me about, you know, Glenn pulling shit out of the trunk and, and, and picking out one or two really good songs and then bringing them to practice to flesh out, you know. So Glenn likes to take the cream of the crop. And so perhaps there's so much shit. And that's what like a song like maybe Drive Me Into Harpies in the Night or D Just Drive Me or, or Harpies in the Night or whatever the fuck it is. You know, that's what that is. That's where it exists. That's where it lives. And perhaps the, he just still has a box of that stuff. You know, just just collecting dust. You know, if Manny has this, and then who knows what Jerry has? Think about all the runoff tapes. Jerry probably has like just lying. Jerry probably has it like holding up a computer, like it's like a coaster or something. And he's like, oh, oh yeah, you know, like 
you know, Jerry's like, oh, hey, look at this. Oh, it's cool. Hey, hey, here, kid, have this, you know, just like to make somebody like fucking happy. Because Jerry's the kind of guy that's like wants to make people happy. He's like, oh, here, hey, kid, have my bass. So my point to all of this is, is that who knows what is really out there. Perhaps that uh, both scream like harpies in the night or sing like harpies in the night is just as valid as what I'm about to tell you right now that I heard on this tape, Drive Me. Um, back to the song Harpies in the Night, Drive Me, Scream Like Harpies in the Night, whatever the fuck I'm hearing. Um, overall, it is once again pure doors. This song is pure fucking doors. Either that's how Glenn wanted to present them at the time, or much like the Ramones trying to write Beach Boy songs, or as Paris Mayhew once uh, told me at his loft, uh, the Cro-Mags were just trying to play like Motorhead. You try something out with inspiration in mind, right? And this is, goes back to being just a musician in general. You're influenced by something. The Ramones were influenced heavily by the Beach Boys. They're influenced by a lot of shit, by the Stooges. The Ramones are heavily influenced by the Beach Boys. So what happens when they try to write a Beach Boys song? What do you think Sheena is a punk rocker is? That's a fucking Beach Boys song. They're trying to do Beach Boys songs, and it's coming out like Sheena is a punk rocker. It goes through one ear, it goes through the computer, and I kind of like, I kind of like think that like it. What happens is it's influenced by your flavor, your ability, and your sensibility, right? Um, it's kind of like a filter plugin on Pro Tools. You put the sound through the filter plugin, and it comes out sounding like something else. Uh, it comes out sounding completely different. So in one ear goes a Beach Boys song for Joey Ramone or for Glenn. In one ear, he's like, oh, yeah, the doors. Yeah, whatever, you know. Um, and out comes Harpies in the Night. Out comes Sheena is a punk rocker. And that's like the beauty. Drive like Harpies in the Night. Maybe, Denise, maybe. Maybe it is drive like Harpies in the Night. Who knows? Um, point is, is that it comes... It comes out, man. It comes out differently, man. It just comes out differently. The Doors piano kicks in to take the steering wheel from the bass. So we have the plotting bass line to go back, circling back now. Doom, 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 doom. And then, and then the piano sounds like a Doors song. It sounds like it could be straight off of fucking, like, uh, LA Woman or whatever. Just anything. It's like, it's like, um, it's like, Dun, 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 But then he, get, he bunches up the, the keys, like, dun, 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 something like that. Like, he's like, he's trying to, like, create speed with the dun, dun, dun. So it's like, doom, 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 dun, 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 something like that. Uh, and Glenn is, okay, and then, and then here's, this is the part that just, Paul Bearer, when I interviewed Paul Bearer from Sheer Terror for this project, hardcore guy, he says that Glenn can just stretch out notes with his voice. And he doesn't do it later on in the hardcore years. Like, blah, 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 you know, or he's like, just like barking shit. But early on, he would stretch those notes. He would croon. As I said last week, his voice is a velvety croon. It's like, it's like, uh, soft, but with a rough edge at the same time. And so vo Glenn's voice manages to croon in the form of wailing, if that is even possible. It is almost operatic. He's almost like... I don't know what the hell he was saying. He was just going... No, no, no. Then the keys start to bunch up. Thank you, Ian, for the source, too. That's what I wanted. Um, he just, it, the keys bunch up. He's going, no, 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 I'm butchering this. Uh, I'm sorry. I am butchering this. This is not, this is just how I'm hearing it in my head, man. I don't know. I don't know. Don't judge me for this. But then, like, um, then the piano bunches up. It's like, Dun, it's like dun 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 because the song speeds up. The song speeds up, right? Um 
It's almost operatic. It's everything you would want from a lost mi Misfits track until the piano sets us up for dun 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 dun. And Glenn sings this very, this I remember so clear. I remember it clear as day. This is the one of those lyrics I remember. It, it's crystal, crystal clear for the most part, except for one word, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so he's going dun 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 dun. And then he goes, and this is the thing that I sing to myself more than anything. It's more than I sing harpy, sing like harpies in the night. Now I sit. This is the thing that I like every, when I'm on the way to work. I hum this when I'm, you know, uh, mowing the lawn because the lawnmower is too loud to play music. So I'm just humming this in my head. Uh, you know, when I'm changing my daughter's diaper, uh, he goes. It goes dun 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 dun, and then the piano kind of—I don't remember what the piano does, but this is the melody for sure, and this is the fucking lyric he sings. He goes, <clears throat> he goes, it goes dun 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 dun. I'll shake my guts out for you, like something like that, man. Like just. <laughs> he's just stretching every note, man. He's stretching every note. And it's either he's saying, I shook my guts out for you. I think he's saying, I took my guts out for you. I took my guts out for you. He goes, I shook my guts out for... No, I took my guts out. Whatever, shook or took, one of those two. I, I always say shook. It's took. I believe it's took. I took my... Or later in the song that he says took. I don't remember. One of the two. Maybe he says shook and then he says took. But he goes, I took my guts out. But the one thing is for certain, the for you, he goes, for you, or for you. Or he's just, he's stretching it. He's just stretching it. And then there's some garbled something. And then he goes... Something in the night, something to not hide. No, strangers in the night, strangers to not hide. Or we're just something in the night, we're just strangers in the night, lovers in the night. Stranger, I shook my guts out for you. We're strangers dun, dun, in the night. And meanwhile, um, and then, and then, and then one thing that is very clear, and this is why I think it's Harpies in the Night. This is what made me think it's Harpies in the Night. He, so clearly to me, he said, now you've got his Harpies in, now you've got his Harpies in the night, or Harpies in tonight. And then it goes back to doom, 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 so he goes, now you've got his harpies in tonight. Something in the night, who died tonight. I feel like I just watched the movie yesterday. <laughs> I just watched the movie yesterday, the Beatles movie, where the guy, the Beatles disappear, and the guy's like trying to remember how to play all the Beatles songs from scratch. Except he's a musician. So it's like, I shook my gun sound for you. And then he goes, and then at the very end, it's like, and now, because it goes into an instrumental break, right? But before it does, he finishes the, the chorus, whatever you want to call it. He goes, now you've got his hoppies in. Now you've got his hoppies in the night. It's either tonight or in the night or something night. It ends with night. You hear a night. But it sounds like there's an extra word in there, but that wouldn't make sense. I don't fucking know. I don't fucking know. Now that I've embarrassed the shit out of myself on Facebook Live. Uh, Manny's drums sound like a train chugging along, tight in the pocket. Uh, this is during the instrumental. So it's like Manny's drums the whole time. Just like He's just playing tight in the pocket. Just... It's, it's like... um Wait. Something like that. And then later on, he says, uh, Now you've got his hobbies in tonight. And then Glenn does this. Glenn does this. And then that's when Manny goes in. That's when Manny starts chugging like a train. Um, Glenn, does a, Glenn does like a piano roll, but it sounds like 
it sounds like a baby piano. It doesn't sound like, like we've seen the picture of what the piano is, but it just sounds, it just goes, it's just like, so he goes, something like that. And then the drums are just like, they're just chugging along. They're just, the drums are chugging along. I can't replicate them. It's like, it just feels like a choo-choo train and be like, I can't. I'm not a drummer, man. Something like that. And then Glenn starts singing over that. And and he's just going. Um, overall, uh, wait. Uh, Glenn does a piano roll again. Instrumentally, the song is completely based around the piano with a rhythm section to support it. The song uh, is surprisingly full for keys, bass, and drums. Is it a testament? It is a testament to the power they had even without a guitar. So that is something that I noticed. The sound for for the bass and drums and the keys, it's power, it's still very powerful. It's still very um, full. Uh, it would have been very interesting if he had held on to the piano uh, and they kept the guitar. The point is, it would have been very interesting if Glenn had kept the keyboard, which wouldn't have worked in that hardcore sound that they had later on, how that would have influenced Doyle while playing guitar. How would those two instruments have interacted? Doyle's rudimentary guitar playing with uh, Glenn's uh, piano. And of course, by that stage, Glenn's a front man. He doesn't really want, you know, he doesn't want to look like he's playing the piano, whatever. Like I said, so it sounds surprisingly full for, for these three instruments. It's a testament to their power. And, you know, I think that's pretty freaking cool. You know, like that's a pretty cool thing when you think about it. Um, uh, so the song chorus, I put chorus in question marks, repeats that same thing. I shook my, or I took my guts out for you, repeats. And then maybe it's shook or took instead of shake. I thought also it might have been shake. The song ends with Glenn letting us know something along the lines of, now you've got a zombie babe tonight. He's saying, now you got a da 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 the fuck was I talking about? So yeah, so it ends with like something along with now you've got a zombie babe. It sounds like he's saying zombie babe tonight or something babe tonight. But early on, it sounds like he's saying now you've got harpies in, now you've got harpies in, now you've got harpies in the night. Something like that. Um, but that kind of counteracts the we scream like harps in the night or sing like harps in the night. Or maybe what my guy meant to say was scream thy copies in the night. In any case, either way, I mean, it was just, it's just amazing. It was amazing to hear this. It was amazing to hear this, this song. Um, it's by far, I think it's by far my favorite one that I got to hear from, from this stuff. Here's one thing I will talk about. So remember how I said, <clears throat> and maybe this will be after, you know, there are two more tracks that I really want to explore in depth. And then we'll do a general overview of the rest of the set from songs that everybody knows, which is like little notes here or there. There's three more tracks that are of, of note that we, we really, really want to uh, talk about. Yeah, Adriano, none of this stuff is on Harpies or West End is not on YouTube and you're not going to find it on YouTube. Um, and if it ever came up on YouTube, that would be a real, I think that would be really sad because... I'd really like to see an official release of that stuff. And if that stuff gets out on YouTube, it might never, ever be released. And um, I think the people that made those recordings deserve to get paid. Um, you know, see some, some coin from that stuff. This series has been brought to you by my Patreon and my YouTube memberships. Yes, this is the lifeblood that goes into the Frumis channel. Basically, what it is is a very large, vast archive of hours and hours of material that you cannot find anywhere on the YouTube show publicly and uh, are only available behind the wall. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full-time. I want this to be my full-time job. 
In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full time uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> so right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6 and 66 cents. <laughs> The YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind-the-scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just wanna thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes. That's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! So every week now, uh, as I've been doing, experimenting with this sort of online content, I listened to this recording three years ago, and um, I I took notes. The, the first thing I did after I listened to this uh, recording from 1977, when the Misfits were still a three-piece, although actually Frank uh, has confirmed, after speaking to his... Um, father that he did play on half of that show. I was even writing things down so I wouldn't forget anything. I was writing things down while we were listening to the show. I wanted to remember this shit forever. So we're, what we're going to talk about now is Infant Stranger. That's right. I just said Infant Stranger. What the fuck is that? Or like, wait, what is that Misfit song? Yeah, that's a Misfit song. Blew my fucking mind when I found out. So we're, we've gone through, we've actually done, we did track three uh, two weeks ago, we did track four last week, and now we're doing track five tonight. And these are my thoughts on 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 Infant Stranger, both at the time and slightly expanded. Hearing Harpies in the Night was an unbelievable experience that I never thought I would get in my life. At the time I wrote this, I'm pretty sure that I was listening to Harpies in the Night. I still think I was listening to Harpies in the Night. Who fucking knows? Then Life, Fate, whatever you want to call it, said, Here, hold my beer. The next track begins. Another Doors tune. My brain can't place it. So you know when you're like, sometimes when you listen to music at a really loud volume and you can't like make out what the fuck you're hearing, you're like, oh, I think I'm hearing this. And you're like, not really sure what it is that you're hearing. You're just kind of like, you're trying to discern what it is, but the music's too loud. It's too distorted or whatever. My brain is trying to like register what it is that I'm hearing right now. This is no Misfit song I recognize. My brain can't place it, let alone comprehend the uncomprehendable, because that's what this was. This was my, okay, <clears throat> as I just talked about Tank saying that, you know, every once in a while you get a George Germain's uh, bottom drawer in, their, in his filing cabinet. This was my George Germain's bottom drawer in a filing cabinet. My brain can't place it, let alone comprehend the uncomprehendable. Manny tells me it's Infant Stranger. What the fuck is Infant Stranger? Holy shit. What the fuck is Infant Stranger? That is not how it was supposed to go today. Like, this is not what we, like, this is not what I was planning. I was like, oh, maybe I'm going to get to hear that Marble Index song. Oh, maybe I'm going to get to hear um, West End Avenue, which I did. Maybe I'm going to get to hear Harpies in the Night, which I did. Um, maybe I will get to hear Feline Nursery. I would. 
But there was no plan for Infant Stranger. Nobody knows what Infant Stranger is. It never, it doesn't exist. We, we, we never would have known it existed if it was not for this tape. Manny had mentioned uh, talking about a song called Marble Index. We knew about the other three from Misfit Central. And Glenn, Glenn's pre-fits bands were playing half covers, half originals. So the bands that Glenn was in uh, before Misfits were playing covers like New York Dolls, Lou Reed songs, um, Blue Cheer, stuff like that, probably some Black Sabbath. Uh, and then they were doing original songs. But n no, no one's ever mentioned this track, Infant Stranger. So uh, I say, but never uh, was there made mention of this track. And I say that, and this is my description, it's dripping in the doors. That's what it is, man. Uh, Infant Stranger is just another one of those insane, just doorsy, doors, dory, door, 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 doorsy, door, door, door tracks. It's just very doors, like all the other ones, man. It's just, that's what it is. If the band had put out an album of this art, rock, piano, bass, drums, uh, or perhaps even recorded an LP in June of 77. So, going back to, uh, if I could find it, it was just here. Do, 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 do. Oh, no. So, going back uh, to when they recorded Cough Cool, man. They rec What if they... So, here's an interesting thought. Maybe you've never thought of this. What if the band had not recorded a 7-inch. What in, just in the way that they had done um, 17 songs uh, in the Static Age sessions, what if they did um, 17 songs when they were recording Cough Cool? You know what I mean? So I, I was thinking in my head, I was kind of like, um, so what if the band had put out this like art rock version of, of themselves as like an LP? Um, Infant Stranger might feel like a filler on that album. Okay? So it's not like it's it's not that it's lackluster, it's very interesting. And it's especially interesting because it's this lost song. It's a song that's literally lost to time. As far as we know, there's no there's no studio recording. It was never recorded. It was never it's never been mentioned by anybody. Mark Kennedy doesn't know what this is. Nobody knew what this was. You know, nobody in the fucking band that would come since would know what it is. Once again, Glenn's vocals are the showcase while the piano, drums, and bass drive the song forward. I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, I put great emphasis on the Doors and their influence on the band at this time. But here's something that's interesting about Infant Stranger that you don't, you kind of get it on West End Avenue. I put great emphasis on the Doors for like West End Avenue and like the other songs, but this has something, this one's a little bit uh, different. Um, Infant Stranger is an important reminder of the crooners that Glenn grew up listening to. Uh, too. Obviously, there's Elvis, but also stuff like the Everly Brothers and Dion. So that was a th my biggest takeaway from this song is that it, it's really more of a it's really more of a crooner, and it's a crooner with a piano, right? And it's kind of like I remember this. It goes, it's like infant straight no, um, ding ding ding, infant. It's just infant stranger over and over again. He's like, infant stranger, infant... No, I'm like, I'm totally butchering. That's not what it is. Do not listen to me at all. That's not what it is. He says, infant stranger, and then it's like, da na na But it's super croony. da na na dun 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 I don't know, something like that. Um, <clears throat> it was like, infant stranger, infant... Stranger, something along those lines. I see you. Do, do, do. And then what's interesting is Jerry's bass is really cool. Going back to like when he was plucking, you could tell he's plucking because he's going do 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 do. Like he does this thing in the background when when Glenn is stretching the notes. We're going I see you. And then the 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 you can hear the bass sort of rises up. Like it's like as if it's like a hill. It's like do 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 do. Do, 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 do. So yeah, it, so it felt more, so it reminded me of crooning. Imagine if you could that the piano, drums, and bass are laying down some foreboding yet seductive rhythms. The piano, particularly in this punky art rock kind of way, but with the same chords, fundamentals, notes, tone. I don't know. Like, I don't know what you would describe it as a, as a dark crooning Frank Sinatra song. 
So what I'm saying is the 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 instrumentation is dark and foreboding. It almost feels like this is Glenn's Glenn doing a dark crooning Frank Sinatra song, but as the cough cool misfits. Okay, that's the best way to describe the song. Um, I could easily imagine how great it would be uh, in the studio with the right production. A question that I asked myself after listening uh, listening to this. Where does Infant Stranger fit into the Misfits continuity? Perhaps it predates the Misfits entirely, and its material is from the pre-Misfits bands, the prefits bands. Is Infant Stranger one of those songs from Prostitutes of New York? Prostitutes of New York was one of Ben's uh, blah, blah, was one of Glenn's bands before the Misfits. Uh, another band he had was the Kudat and Bujang band. Another band he had was called Talus. And so perhaps without enough material written at the time, or perhaps, you know, trying out different things and experimenting, Infant Stranger is one of these super early uh, Lost of Time songs that just was thrown into the set or was being rehearsed and obviously got dropped when, when, when Frank Sr., when Franche Comba uh, joined the band on guitar. Wherever Infant Stranger comes from, Lullaby feels like it comes from the same place. More on that another time. So Lullaby is the other lost track. That's right. It's not just Infant Stranger. There is this motherfucking song called Motherfucking Lullaby, and we're going to get to it, and that song too. So not only did I hear Infant Stranger, but I heard the song Lullaby. Uh, yeah, Infant Stranger. It's an interesting, it's an interesting song. Infant Stranger, Infant Stranger. Something like that. Oh, 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 and the piano's like, Dun, dun. Oh no, not the piano. Yeah, the piano goes. The, he goes. Dun, 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 dun. There's like this. It's either the piano or the bass is going. Dun, 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 dun. Again, not a musician. Do not know how to do music shit. Trying to tell you things from a non musician perspective. I see you. Dun, 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 dun. Something like that. <laughs> All right, so we're we're at the section of the show where we talk about uh, another one of these lost uh, recordings um, from that amazing fucking live show from 1977. So this is track number nine, or this was track number nine in the set list that they play, played at this live show, 1977. You've heard the story before. We've talked about it the last three shows. If you haven't, go find them. They're on YouTube. They're on my page. Go find them and yada, yada, yada. Here's my notes for Lullaby. You've never heard Glenn Danzig croon the way he croons on Lullaby. M mind you, again, we've already heard the song Infant Stranger. We've already heard the song uh, Harpies in the Night, and we've heard West End Avenue. It's like, what, how, could, how could this possibly get any crazier? And it's like, oh, there's another law song called Lullaby. Same shock. It's the same shock that, you know, I had listening to Infant Stranger, and they're one, it's, you know, they're, 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 uh, it was a few songs down, but still, it's like, whoa, there was another Lost Song Lullaby. And, you know, this I remember very clearly. Right before the, the, the song starts, I'm going, what the fuck does a song like Lullaby sound like? Because he starts off, he says, this one's called Lullaby. So I'm like, Lullaby? What does Lullaby sound like? Infant Stranger sounds like a, 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 a crooner, and it's like, what could Lullaby possibly sound like? And this is my thought at the time. Um, you've never heard Glenn Danzig croon the way he croons on Lullaby. Last week I talked about how Infant Stranger sounds like a cross between the doors and a very dark Frank Sinatra serenade. Manny's drums seem to be... Oh, so let me, let me comment on that for a minute. So yeah, that's pretty much what it is. Again, um, it's very fucking Dorsey, but it's Dorsey by the way of Frank Sinatra, just like Infant Stranger. Um, it's just, it's dark, man. It's dark, but it's a crooner. Um, Manny's drums seem to be playing as much to the vocal as they are keeping the beat. So there are some drummers out there that play to the vocal, and they don't play to just keep the beat. A great example is Keith Moon. Keith Moon is not, oh, Keith Moon's holding the beat, but Keith Moon is such a, a, a fucking fancy player or whatever, maniac of a guy, that he's also playing to the voice. The same thing, I guess, could be said for John Bonham, right? So that's kind of like what Manny is doing a little bit here. Um, there's a lot of uh, just sort of 
drum, there's a lot of drum rolls or some fills. Um, Glenn opens the song with a croon that he hasn't done on any song since. And I truly fucking believe that when, when, when hearing that song, it, it, it blows, it blows your mind. Cause you're like, what does baby lullaby sound like? It sounds something like this. It goes, -da 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 -da. like something like that. He just, his voice just out of the gate. Like the song doesn't build. There's no fucking instrumentation to get you to that. He just starts going. It's just like, uh, it's just like, sparkle from the wheel, and it, and it's just so it's so Dorsey, and it's just so. This is what I said at the time. This is what I wrote at the time. He rises up and stretches a note, showing the full power of his voice. He almost sounds trained by lessons. It just punches your ears. Right in their faces. So my ears are listening to Glenn go, Swago from the real, real. And all of a sudden, it's like there are fists right in my ears. Uh, Curtis asks a very interesting question. Why doesn't Glenn ever talk about the Doors influence? I don't fucking know, man. I mean, you have you hear people casually mention the Doors. Like, they're listing a bunch of things. Elvis, blah, 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 comma, Jim Morrison always comes up it's one of the commas. It's one of like the, the things listed, but that's it. There's no other exploration. And the thing is, I think why I think Glenn doesn't bring it up because I think maybe like it's almost maybe it's he's embarrassed by how much he took from them that early. Because he took a lot from them that early. When you hear these songs, you're like, holy shit, they're fucking door songs. But they're but like I said, it's also like a Frank Sinatra song. Um this is what I said at the time. Soft yet powerful Jim Morrison haunting bravado. Smoke from your real, real. And then something like, I'll never cry, I'll never cry. Like, if that's what it sounds like, you know. Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Um, and then the, there's like an instrumentation part. Here's what I said about his vocals, too. Um, ominous, nefarious, something. This is what I thought about the song Lullaby. Um, ominous nefarious, something that once had childlike innocence turned deadly, like the evil vibes that all children's fairy tales and nursery rhymes used to carry. So it's like this thing that like, you know, like kind of like a, a lullaby. Yes, Curtis, that's right. He did jack that fucking album cover. So his, his, his worship of Jim Morrison is very fucking like, it's subtle, man. Like he just keeps it kind of like on the DL. But if you listen to some, there's a song or two. I think I don't mind the pain. Sounds very Jim Morrison-y on uh, four, um, but yeah. But this song lullaby, it just holy fucking shit. It's like it's it's like a it's like an evil. It, it's the evil vibe from a children's fairy tale or nursery rhyme. You know, um, it's it's just like. And then here's another thing that I said. I said. If there was punk in the 40s, the next song, and, and they said the next song was going to be a fast one, it would be Lullaby. There's a menace and doom, but it too is like a waltz in its own way. So it's like if, you know, like you have like swing music or whatever, like soft, soft music from the 40s. When you think about 40s singles or whatever, like I would imagine that Lullaby would be like the punk rock version of one of those songs. And it's just like, and it starts off with this. Some of all the real, real. I'll, I'll never cry, no, never cry, no, 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 no. Um, Now, here's where I want to talk about going back. Going back to Jerry, um, Jerry's bass playing and Manny's drumming. Ready? There is really something to be said about the chemistry between Jerry Only and Manny Martinez as a rhythm section. They seem to be so locked into each other. As important as a rhythm section is in rock music and in all music. So, I mean, in general, a rhythm section is a very important thing. Um, it seems to be taken to another level when there is no guitar to speak of. So because it's just drums, bass, and, 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 and piano, like, the bass and drums take on, like, extra roles besides just being, you know, holding the beat and being, like, the rhythm section. And Jerry's bass playing, even for a beginner, he was a beginner at the time, he's fucking excellent, man. He really was. You know, he was a good fucking bass player. And you know what the thing is? And here's what I said. Manny slings plenty of fills and drum rolls before Jerry became hardcore, meaning before he started going, ah, 
boom, 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 like, you know, a uh, vacuum cleaner in a blender. Boom, 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 boom. Um, he was exceptionally talented in his bass duties. Uh, that is not to say he was not later on, but like Doyle, I feel like they slipped into niches. That's what they did. Jerry only and Doyle found a thing that they're really fucking good at. They're really good at being these th this image of these big hulking dudes that play their instruments in a very particular way on instruments that they designed themselves. You know, these guys workshop their own guitars. They know a lot about... F whether you love them or hate them, whether you don't think they're talented or not, they know a lot about fucking instrumentation, and they know a lot about fucking putting, making musical instruments, because they fucking build that shit themselves. Know what I'm saying? Um, so there's something to be said for that. And I think they, you know, learned some of that, a lot of that from that dude, George Germain, that we just spoke about last week. You know, like, he showed them... He showed them... Uh, that stuff. And so it's like, it's like, it's like, but you can hear, you, you can hear, like, there's, there's definitely some, like, the blossoming talent in Jerry, and then it's just like, it stops. You know what I mean? It's like they were more concerned about the image and being, like, meaner, harder, and faster, and so it's like, everything kind of goes to shit. All of a sudden, Glenn is speeding up his singing. He sounds like a ferocious Wolverine instead of a, an evil crooner. You know what I mean? You need pockets of, 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 of sound or pockets of space. There needs to be space in the song for, for proper croonage. And there isn't in, in, the, in the later versions of those songs. Hey, day, hey, day, people want to talk about it. Hey. And they're fucking great and we love them. I love them. But, you know, it's like, attitude. You got some fucking attitude. Instead of, attitude. You got some fucking attitude. You know, it's like, it just doesn't, everything is, there's more urgency. It's more about the energy than it is about the music itself. Um, so there's that, there's, there's that to be said, but yeah, but there's definitely some chemistry between Jerry and Manny and, and Jerry is really filling things out with his fucking bass, man. Um, and this is what was my thing. I said, I feel like they slipped J Jerry and Doyle. I feel like they slipped into niches and never really grew in their instruments like they could and should have like on one level, you know, fucking Doyle can play a rhythm guitar like, you know, he plays rhythm guitar like fucking um, Johnny Ramone. Like, he just, he has that downward buzzsaw, you know, technique. Uh, but that's all that he does. And he does, like, he, he knows how to do the elephants. He bends the neck of his guitar, you know, and makes that crazy sound. And Jerry, you know, Jerry just does a... You know, vacuum cleaner in a blender. And that's it.